Act One of The Clandestine Marriage by David Garrick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Stage directions read by Michelle Eaton. Dramatis Personae. Lord Ogilby. Read by Greg Giordano. Sir John Melville, read by Adrian Stevens. Sterling, read by Todd. Lovewell, read by Jim Locke. Canton, read by Alan Mapstone. Brush, read by Krista Zaleski. Sergeant Flower, read by John Payton. Traverse, read by Algy Pag. Servant, read by David Purdy. Mistress Heidelberg, read by Wendy Katzhiller. Miss Sterling, read by Annie Mars. Fanny, read by Jen Broda. Betty, read by Adrienne Provost. Chambermaid, read by Mira Williams. Trusty, read by Lauren Emma. Stage Directions, read by Michelle Eaton. Act One. Scene, a room in Sterling's house. Miss Fanny and Betty meeting. Ma'am, Miss Fanny, ma'am. What's the matter? Betty! Oh, la, ma'am, as sure as I'm alive, here is your husband. Hush, my dear Betty. If anybody in the house should hear you, I am ruined. Mercy on me! It has frightened me to such a degree that my heart has come up to my mouth. But, as I was saying, ma'am, here's that dear, sweet— Have a care, Betty! Lord, I am bewitched, I think. But, as I was saying, ma'am, here's Mr. Lovewell just come from London. Indeed? Yes, indeed. And indeed, ma'am, he is. I saw him crossing the courtyard in his boots. I am glad to hear it. But pray now, my dear Betty, be cautious— don't mention that word again on any account. You know we have agreed never to drop any expressions of that sort for fear of an accident. Dear ma'am, you may depend upon me. There is not a more trustier creature on the face of the earth than I am. Though I say it, I am as secret as the grave, and if it's never told till I tell it, it may remain untold till doomsday for Betty. I know you are faithful, but in our circumstances we cannot be too careful. Very true, ma'am. And yet I vow and protest, there's more plague than pleasure in a secret, especially if a body mayn't mention it to four or five of one's particular acquaintance. Do but keep this secret a little while longer, and then I hope you may mention it to anybody. Mr. Lovewell will acquaint the family with the nature of our situation as soon as possible. The sooner the better, I believe, for if he does not tell it, there's a little tell-tale I know of will come and tell it for him. Fie, Betty! Blushing. Ah, you may well blush, but you're not so sick and so pale and so wan and so many qualms. Have done. I shall be quite angry with you. Angry? Bless the dear puppet. I am sure I shall love it as much as if it was my own. I meant no harm, heaven knows. Well, say no more of this. It makes me uneasy. All I have to ask of you is to be faithful and secret, and not to reveal this matter till we disclose it to the family ourselves. Me reveal it? If I say a word I wish I may be burned, I would not do any harm for the world, and as for Mr. Lovewell, I am sure I have loved the dear gentleman ever since he got a tidewaiter's place for my brother, but let me tell you both, you must leave off your soft looks to each other, and your whispers, and your glances, and your always sitting next to one another at dinner, and your long walks together in the evening— for my part, if I had not been in the secret, I should have known you were a pair of lovers at least, if not man and wife, as— See there now, again, pray, be careful. Well, well, nobody hears me. Man and wife, I'll say so no more. What I tell you is very true for all that. Love well, calling within. We, um— Hark, I hear your husband. What? I say, here comes Mr. Lovewell. Mind the caution I give you. I'll be whipped now if you are not the first person he sees or speaks to in the family. However, if you choose it, it's nothing at all to me. As you sow, you must reap. As you brew, you must bake. I'll even flip down the back stairs and leave you together. Exit. Fanny alone. I see. 
I see I shall never have a moment's ease till our marriage is made public. New distresses crowd in upon me every day. The solicitude of my mind sinks my spirits, preys upon my health, and destroys every comfort of my life. It shall be revealed. Let what will be the consequence. Enter love well. My love, how's this in tears? Indeed, this is too much. You promise me to support your spirits and to wait the determination of our fortune with patience for my sake for your own be comforted why will you study to add to our uneasiness and perplexity oh mr lovewell the indelicacy of a secret marriage grows every day more and more shocking to me i walk about the house like a guilty wretch i imagine myself the object of suspicion of the whole family and am under the perpetual terrors of a shameful detection indeed indeed you are to blame the amiable delicacy of your temper and your quick sensibility only serve to make you unhappy to clear up this affair properly to mr sterling is the continual employment of my thoughts everything now is in a fair train it begins to grow ripe for a discovery and have no doubt of its concluding to the satisfaction of ourselves of your father and the whole family and how it will i am resolved it shall end soon very soon i would not live another week in this agony of mind to be the mistress of the universe do not be too violent neither do not let us disturb the joy of your sister's marriage with the tumult this matter may occasion i brought letters from lord ogleby and sir john melville to mr sterling they will be here this evening and i dare say within this hour i am sorry for it why so no matter only let us disclose our marriage immediately as soon as possible but directly in a few days you may depend on it to-night or to-morrow morning that i fear will be impracticable nay but you must must why indeed you must i have the most alarming reasons for it alarming indeed for they alarm me even before i am acquainted with them what are they i cannot tell you not tell me not at present when all is settled you shall be acquainted with everything sorry they are coming must be discovered what can this mean is it possible you can have any reason that need be concealed from me do not disturb yourself with conjectures but rest assured that though you are unable to divine the cause the consequence of a discovery be it what it will cannot be attended with half the miseries of the present interval you put me upon the rack i would do anything to make you easy but you know your father's temper money you will excuse my frankness is the spring of all actions which nothing but the idea of acquiring nobility or magnificence can ever make him forego and these he thinks his money will purchase you know to your aunts mrs heidelberg's notions of the splendour of high life her contempt for everything that does not relish of what she calls quality and that from the vast fortune in her hands by her late husband she absolutely governs mr sterling and the whole family now if they should come to the knowledge of this affair too abruptly they might perhaps be incensed beyond all hopes of reconciliation but if they are made acquainted with it otherwise than by ourselves it will be ten times worse and a discovery grows every day more probable the whole family have long suspected our affection we are also in the power of a foolish maid-servant and if we may even depend on her fidelity we cannot answer for her discretion discover it therefore immediately lest some accident should bring it to light and involve us in additional disgrace well well i meant to discover it soon but would not do it too precipitately i have more than once sounded mr sterling about it and will attempt him more seriously the next opportunity 
but my principal hopes are these my relationship to lord ogilby and his having placed me with your father have been you know the first links in the chain of this connection between the two families in consequence of which i am at present in high favour with all parties while they all remain thus well affected to me i propose to lay our case before the old lord and if i can prevail on him to mediate in this affair i make no doubt but he will be able to appease your father and being a lord and a man of quality i am sure he may bring mrs heidelberg into good humour at any time let me beg you therefore to have but a little patience as you see we are upon the very eve of a discovery that must probably be to our advantage manage it your own way i am persuaded but in the meantime make yourself easy as easy as i can i will we had better not remain together any longer at present think of this business and let me know how you proceed depend on my care but pray be cheerful i will as she is going out enter sterling a hey day who have we got here fanny confused mr lovewell sir and where are you going hussy to my sister's chamber sir exit ah lovewell what always getting my foolish girl yonder into a corner well well let us but once see her elder sister safe married to sir john melville will soon provide a good husband for fanny i'll warrant you would to heaven sir you would provide her one of my recommendation yourself hey love well with your pleasure sir mighty well and i flatter myself that such a proposal would not be very disagreeable to miss fanny better and better and if i could but obtain your consent sir what you marry fanny no no that will never do lovewell you're a good boy to be sure i have a great value for you i can't think of you as a son-in-law there's no stuff in the case no money lovewell my pretensions to fortune indeed are but moderate but though not equal to splendour sufficient to keep us above distress add to which that i hope by diligence to increase it and have love honour but not the stuff lovewell add one little round zero to the sum total of your fortune and that will be the finest thing you can say to me you know i've a regard for you would do anything to serve you anything on the footing of friendship but if you think me worthy of your friendship sir be assured that there is no instance in which i should rate your friendship so highly pshaw pshaw that's another thing you know where money or interest is concerned friendship is quite out of the question but where the happiness of a daughter is at stake you would not scruple sure to sacrifice a little to her inclinations inclinations why you would not persuade me that the girl is in love with you a eh, lovewell i cannot absolutely answer for miss fanny sir but am sure that the chief happiness or misery of my life depends entirely upon her why indeed now if your kinsman lord ogilby would come down handsomely for you but that's impossible no no it will never do i must hear no more of this come lovewell promise me that i shall hear no more of this lovewell hesitating i'm afraid sir i should not be able to keep my word with you if i did promise you why you would not offer to marry her without my consent would you lovewell marry her sir confused ay marry her sir i know very well that a warm speech or two from such a dangerous young spark as you are will go much farther towards persuading a silly girl to do what she has more than a month's mind to do than twenty grave lectures from fathers or mothers or uncles or aunts to prevent her but you would not sure be such a base fellow 
such a treacherous young rogue, as to seduce my daughter's affections, and destroy the peace of my family in that matter? I must insist on it, that you will give me your word not to marry her without my consent. Sir, I, I, as to that, I, I, I beg, sir, pray, sir, excuse me on this subject at present. Promise, then, that you will carry this matter no further without my approbation. You may depend on it, sir, that it shall go no further. Well, well, that's enough. I'll take care of the rest, I warrant you. Come, come, let's have done with this nonsense. What's doing in town? Any news upon change? Nothing material. Have you seen the currants and soap and Madeira safe in the warehouses? Have you compared the goods with the invoice and bills of lading? And are they all right? They are, sir. And how are stocks? Fell one and a an half this morning. Well, well. Some news from America and they'll be up again. But how are Lord Ogilby and Sir John Melville? When are we to expect them? Very soon, sir. I came on purpose to bring you their commands. Here are letters from both of them. Let me see. Let me see. Slife, how his lordship's letter is perfumed. It takes my breath away. <laughs> Opening it. And French paper, too, with a fine border of flowers and flourishes, and a slippery gloss on it that dazzles one's eyes. My dear Mr. Sterling. Reading. Mercy on me! His lordship writes a worse hand than a boy at his exercise. But how's this? Eh, hey, with you tonight? Reading. Lawyers tomorrow morning. Tonight? That's sudden indeed. Where's my sister Heidelberg? She should know of this immediately. Here, John, Harry, Thomas. Calling the servants. Hark ye, Lovewell. Sir, mind now how I'll entertain his lordship and Sir John. We'll show your fellows at the other end of the town how we live in the city. They shall eat gold and drink gold and lie in gold. Here, cook, butler, calling. What signifies your birth and education and titles? Money, money. That's the stuff that makes the great men in this country. Very true, sir. True, sir. Why, then, have done with your nonsense of love and matrimony. You're not rich enough to think of a wife yet. A man of business should mind nothing but his business. Where are these fellows? John! Thomas! Get an estate, and a wife will follow, of course. Ah, Lovewell, an English merchant is the most respectable character in the universe. So life, man... A rich English merchant may make himself a match for the daughter of a nabob. Where are all my rascals? Here, William. Exit calling. Lovewell alone. So, as I suspected, quite averse to the match and likely to receive the news of it with great displeasure, what's best to be done? Let me see. Suppose I get Sir John Melville to interest himself in this affair he may mention it to lord ogilby with a better grace than i can and more probably prevail on him to interfere in it i can open my mind also more freely to sir john he told me when i left him in town that he had something of consequence to communicate and that i could be of use to him i am glad of it for the confidence he reposes in me and the service i may do him will ensure me his good offices poor fanny it hurts me to see her so uneasy and her making a mystery of the cause adds to my anxiety something must be done upon her account for at all events her solicitude shall be removed exit scene changes to another chamber enter miss sterling and miss fanny Oh, my dear sister, say no more. This is downright hypocrisy. You shall never convince me that you don't envy me beyond measure. Well, after all, 
It's extremely natural. It is impossible to be angry with you. Indeed, sister, you have no cause. And you really pretend not to envy me? Not in the least. And you don't in the least wish that you was just in my situation? No, indeed, I don't. Why should I? Why should you? What? On the brink of marriage, fortune, title? But I had forgot there's that dear sweet creature Mr. Lovewell in the case. You would not break your faith with your true love now for the world, I warrant you. Mr. Lovewell, always Mr. Lovewell. Lord, what signifies Mr. Lovewell, sister? Pretty peevish soul. Oh, my dear, grave, romantic sister. A perfect philosopher in petticoats, love and a cottage, eh, Fanny? Ah, give me indifference and a coach and six. And pray, why not the coach and six without the indifference? But pray, when is this happy marriage of yours to be celebrated? I long to give you joy. In a day or two. I can't tell exactly. Oh, my dear sister, I must mortify her a little. Aside. I know you have pretty taste. Pray, give me your opinion of my jewels. How do you like the style of this esclavage? Showing jewels. Extremely handsome, indeed, and well fancied. What do you think of these bracelets? I shall have a miniature of my father, set round with diamonds to one, and St. John's on the other, and this pair of earrings set transparent. Here, the top, you see, will take off to wear in a morning, or in an undress. How do you like them? Shows jewels. Very much, I assure you. Bless me, sister, you have a prodigious quantity of jewels. You'll be the very queen of diamonds. <laughs> very well, my dear. I shall be as fine as a little queen indeed. I have a bouquet to come home tomorrow, made up of diamonds and rubies and emeralds and topazes and amethysts, jewels of all colours, green, red, blue, yellow, intermixed, the prettiest thing you ever saw in your life. The jeweler says I shall set out with as many diamonds as anybody in town, except Lady Brilliant and Polly, what do you call it, Lord Squander's kept mistress. But what are your wedding cloths, sister? Oh, white and silver to be sure, you know. I bought them at Sir Joseph Luchstring's and sat above an hour in the parlour behind the shop consulting Lady Luchstring about gold and silver stuffs on purpose just to mortify her. Fie, sister! How could you be so abominably provoking? Oh, I have no patience with the pride of your city knights, ladies. Did you never observe the airs of Lady Luchstring's dressed in the richest brocade of her husband's shop? playing crown whilst at haberdasher's hall, while the civil smirking Sir Joseph with a smug wig trimmed round his broad face as close as a new-cut yew hedge, and his shoes so black that they shine again, stands all day in his shop, fastened to his counter like a bad shilling. Indeed, indeed, sister, this is too much. If you talk at this rate, you will be absolutely a byword in the city. You must never venture on the inside of Temple Bar again. Never do I desire it. Never, my dear Fanny. I promise you. Oh, how I long to be transported to the dear regions of Grosvenor Square, far, far from the dull districts of Aldersgate, cheap Candlewick and Farringdon without and within. My heart goes pitter-pat at the very idea of being introduced at court. Gilt chariot, piebald horses, laced liveries, and then the whispers buzzing round the circle. Who is that young lady? Who is she? Lady Melville, ma'am, Lady Melville. My ears tingle at the sound, and then at dinner, instead of my father perpetually asking, any news upon change, to cry, Well, Sir John, any news from Arthur's, or to say to some other woman of quality, 
Was your ladyship at the Duchess of Rubbers last night? Did you call in at Lady Thunder's? In the immensity of crowd, I swear I did not see you. Scarce a soul at the opera last Saturday. Shall I see you at Carlisle House next Thursday? Oh, the dear Beaumont, I was born to move in the sphere of the great world. And so, in the midst of all this happiness, you have no compassion for me, no pity for us poor mortals in common life. You? You're above pity. You could not change conditions with me. You're over your head and ears in love, you know. Nay, for that matter, if Mr. Lovewell and you came together, as I doubt not you will, you will live very comfortably, I dare say. He will mind his business, you'll employ yourself in the delightful care of your family, and once in a season, perhaps, you'll sit together in a front box at a benefit play, as we used to do at our dancing masters, you know. And perhaps I may meet you in the summer with some other citizens at Turnbridge. For my part, I shall always entertain a proper regard for my relations. You shan't want my countenance, I assure you. Oh, you're too kind, sister. Enter Mrs. Heidelberg. Mrs. Heidelberg at entrance. Here this evening. I vow and protest we shall scarce have time to provide for them. Oh, my dear. To Miss Sterling. I am glad to see you're not quite in dishabille. Lord Ogilby and Sir John Melville will be here tonight. Tonight, ma'am? Yes, my dear, tonight. Do put on a smarter cap and change those ordinary ruffles. Lord, I have such a deal to do. I shall scarce have time to slip on my Italian lute string. Where is this doddle of a housekeeper? Enter Mrs. Trusty. Oh, here, Trusty. Do you know that people of quality are expected here this evening? Yes, ma'am. Well, do be sure now that everything is done in the most genteelest manner and to the honour of the family. Yes, ma'am. Well, but mind what I say to you. Yes, ma'am. His lordship is to lie in the chintz bedchamber, do you hear? And Sir John in the blue damask room, his lordship's valet de chambre in the opposite. But Mr. Lovewell has come down, and you know that's his room, ma'am. Well, well, Mr. Lovewell may make shift, or get a bed at the George. But hark ye, trusty. Ma'am? Get the great dining room in order as soon as possible. Unpaper the curtains, take the sivers off the couch and the chairs, and put the china figures on the mantelpiece immediately. Yes, ma'am. Begone, then. Fly this instant. Where's my brother Sterling? Talking to the butler, ma'am. Very well. Exit, trusty. Miss Fanny, I protest I did not see you before. Lord, child, what's the matter with you? With me? Nothing, ma'am. Bless me, why your face is as pale and black and yellow of fifty colours, I protest. And then you have dressed yourself as loose and as big. I declare there is not a thing to be seen now as a young woman with a fine waist. You all make yourselves as round as Mistress Deputy Barter. Go, child. You know the quality will be here by and by. Go and make yourself a little more fit to be seen. Exit Fanny. She has gone away in tears, absolutely crying, I vow and protest. This ridiculous love, we must put a stop to it. It makes a perfect natural of the girl. Poor soul, she can't help it. Affectedly. Well, my dear, now I shall have an opportunity of convincing you of the absurdity of what you was telling me concerning Sir John Meville's behaviour to you. Oh, it gives me no manner of uneasiness, but indeed, ma'am, I cannot be persuaded but that Sir John is an extremely cold lover. 
such distant civility grave looks and lukewarm professions of esteem for me and the whole family i have heard of flames and darts but sir john's is a passion of mere ice and snow oh fie my dear i am perfectly ashamed of you that's so like the notions of your poor sister what you complain of as coldness and indifference is nothing but the extreme gentility of his address an exact picture of the manners of quality oh he is the very mirror of complacence full of formal bows and set speeches i declare if there was any violent passion on my side i should be quite jealous of him i say jealous indeed jealous of who pray my sister fanny she seems a much greater favourite than i am and he pays her infinitely more attention i assure you lord do you think a man of fashion as he is can't distinguish between the genteel and the vulgar part of the family between you and your sister for instance or me and my brother be advised by me child it is all politeness and good breeding nobody knows the quality better than i do in my mind the old lord his uncle has ten times more gallantry about him than sir john he is full of attentions to the ladies and smiles and grins and leers and ogles and fills every wrinkle in his old wizened face with comical expressions of tenderness i think he would make an admirable sweetheart enter sterling sterling at entrance no fish why the pond was dragged but yesterday morning there's carp and tench in the boat pox on it if that dog lovewell had any thought he would have brought down a turbo or some of the land carriage mackerel lord brother i am afraid his lordship and sir john will not arrive while it's light i warrant you but pray sister heidelberg let the turtle be dressed to-morrow and some venison and let the gardener cut some pineapples and get out some ice i'll answer for wine i'll warrant you i'll give them such a glass of champagne as they never drank in their lives no not at a duke's table pray now brother mind how you behave i am always in a fright about you with people of quality take care that you don't fall asleep directly after supper as you commonly do take a good deal of snuff and that will keep you awake and don't burst out with your horrible loud horse laughs it's monstrous vulgar never fear sister who have we here it is monsieur cantoun the swish gentleman that lives with his lordship i vow and protest ah monsieur your servant i am very glad to see you monsieur a most obliged monsieur sterling ma'am i am yours mademoiselle i am yours bowing round your humble servant mr cantoun i kiss your hands madame well monsieur and what news of your good family when are we to see his lordship and sir john monsieur sterling milord ogilby and sir jean melville will be here in one quarter hour i am glad to hear it oh i am prodigious glad to hear it being so late i was afraid of some accident will you please to have anything mr cantoun after your journey no thank you ma'am shall i go and shew you the apartment sir you do me great honour ma'am come then come my dear to miss sterling exeunt pox on it it's almost dark it will be too late to go round the garden this evening however i will carry them to take a peep at my fine canal at least i am determined Exit. End of Act One Act Two of The Clandestine Marriage by David Garrick This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Scene An Antechamber to Lord Ogilby's Bedchamber Table with Chocolate and Small Case for Medicines Enter Brush, my Lord's Valet de Chambre and Stirling's Chambermaid You shall stay, my dear, I insist upon it Nay, pray, sir, don't be so positive. I can't stay indeed. You shall take one cup to our better acquaintance. I seldom drinks chocolate, and if I did, one has no satisfaction with such apprehensions about one. If my lord should wake, or the Swiss gentleman should see one, or Madame Heidelberg should know of it, I should be frightened to death. Besides, I've had my tea already this morning. Oh, I'm sure I hear my lord. In a fright. No, no, madam, don't flutter yourself. The moment my lord wakes, he rings his bell, which I answer sooner or later, as it suits my convenience. But should he come upon us without ringing? I'll forgive him if he does. Takes a file out of the case. This key locks him up till I please to let him out. La, no, sir, that's apothecary stuff. It is so, but without this he can no more get out of bed. Then he can read without spectacles. Sips. What with qualms, age, rheumatism, and a few surfeits in his youth, he must have a great deal of brushing, oiling, screwing, and winding up to set him going for the day. Sips. That's prodigious indeed. Sips. My lord seems quite in a decay. Yes, he's quite a spectacle. Sips. A mere corpse till he is revived and refreshed from our little magazine here. When the restorative pills and cordial waters warm his stomach and get into his head, vanity frisks in his heart, and then he gets up for the lover, the rake, and the fine gentleman. Sips. Poor gentleman, but should the swishman come upon us? Why, then, the English gentleman would be very angry. No foreigner must break in upon my privacy. Sips. But I can assure you, Monsieur Canton is otherwise employed. He is obliged to skim the cream of half a score of newspapers for my lord's breakfast. <laughs> Pray, madam, drink your cup peaceably. My lord's chocolate is remarkably good. He won't touch a drop but what comes from Italy. Sipping. Tis very fine indeed. Sips. And charmingly perfumed, it smells for all the world like our young lady's dressing boxes. You have an excellent taste, madam, and I must beg of you to accept a few cakes for your own drinking. Takes them out of a drawer in the table. And in return, I desire nothing but to taste the perfume of your lips. Kisses her. A small return of favours, madam, will make, I hope, this country and retirement agreeable to both. He bows, she curtsies. Your young ladies are quite fine girls, Faith. Sips. Though upon my soul I am quite of my old lord's mind about them, and were I inclined to matrimony I should take the youngest. Sips. Miss Fanny's the most aftless, and the most natured created. And the eldest a little haughty or so? More haughtier and prouder than Saturn himself, but this I say quite confidential to you, for one would not hurt a young lady's marriage, you know. Sips. By no means, but you can't hurt it with us. We don't consider tempers. We want money, Mrs. Nancy. Give us enough of that. We'll abate you a great deal in other particulars. <laughs> Bless me. Here's somebody. Bell rings. Oh, tis my lord. Well, your servant, Mr. Brush. I'll clean the cups in the next room. Do so, but never mind the bell. I shan't go this half hour. Will you drink tea with me in the afternoon? Not for the world, Mr. Brush. I'll be here to set all things to rights, but I must not drink tea indeed, and so your servant. Exit made with tea board. Bell rings again. It is impossible to stupefy oneself in the country for a week without some little flirting with the Abigails. This is much the handsomest wench in the house, except the old citizen's youngest daughter, and I have not time enough to lay a plan for her. Bell rings. 
and now I'll go to my lord, for I have nothing else to do. Going. Enter Canton, with newspapers in his hand. Monsieur Brush, Mr. Brush, my lord, stir yet. He has just rung his bell. I am going to him. Dépêchez-vous donc. Exit Brush. Puts on spectacles. I wish the devil had all these papiers. I forget as fast as I read. The advertiser put out of my head the gazette, the gazette, the chronique, and so they all go l'un après l'autre. I must get some nouvelle for my lord, or he'll be a rage contre moi. Voyons! Reads in the papers. Here is nothing but the anti sejanus and advertise. What you want, child? Only the chocolate things, sir. Oh, very well. That is good, girl. And very pretty, too. Exit maid. Lord Ogleby within. Canton? He? He? <coughs> Canton! I come, my lord. What shall I do? I have no news. He will make grand take to Lord Ogleby within. Canton, I say. Canton, where are you? Enter Lord Ogleby, leaning on brush. Here, my lord. I ask pardon, my lord. I have not finished the papier. Damn your pardon and your papers. I want you here, Canton. Then I run, that is all. Shuffles along. Lord Ogleby leans upon Canton too, and comes forward. You Swiss are the most unaccountable mixture. You have the language and the impertinence of the French, with the laziness of Dutchmen. Tis very true, my lord. I can't help. Oh, diavolo! You are not in pain, I hope, my lord. Indeed, but I am, my lord. That vulgar fellow Sterling, with his city politeness, would force me down his slope last night to see a clay-coloured ditch, which he calls a canal. And what with the dew and the east wind, my hips and shoulders are absolutely screwed to my body. A little veritable old Darquie Buffard will set you all right again. My lord sits down. Brush gives chocolate. Where are the palsy drops, Brush? Here, my lord. Pouring out. Quelle nouvelle avez vous, Canton? A great deal of papier, but no news at all. What? Nothing at all, you stupid fellow. Yes, my lord. I have little advertise here who give you more pleasure than all the lies about nothing at all. La voila! Puts on his spectacles. Come, read it, Canton, with good emphasis and good discretion. I will, my lord. Canton reads. There is no question but that the cosmetique royale will utterly take away all heats, pimps, frecks, and other eruptions of the skin, and likewise the wrinkle of old age, etc., etc. A great deal more, my lord. Be sure to ask for the cosmetique royale, Signed by the doctor own hand. There is more reason for this caution than good men will think. Eh bien, my lord. Eh bien, Canton. Will you purchase any? For you, my lord. For me, you old puppy, for what? My lord. Do I want cosmetics? My lord. Look in my face. Come, be sincere. Does it want the assistance of art? 
Canton with his spectacles. Oh, really, Tay? No. Tis very smooth and brilliant, but I thought that you might take a little by way of prevention. You thought like an old fool, monsieur, as you generally do. That surfeit water brush. Brush pours out. What do you think, brush, of this family? We are going to be connected with, eh? Very well to marry in, my lord. But it would not do to live with. You are right, Bruce. There is no washing the blackamoor white. Mr. Sterling will never get rid of black friars. Always taste of the barachio, and the poor woman, his sister, is so busy and so notable to make one welcome that I have not yet got over her first reception. It almost amounted to suffocation. I think the daughters are tolerable. Where's my Catholic snuff? Brush gives him a box. They think so of you, my lord, for they look at nothing else, ma foi. Did they? Why, I think they did a little. Where's my glass? Brush puts one on the table. The youngest is <laughs> delectable. Takes snuff. Oh, ay, my lord, very delect indeed. She may do you at you, my lord. She was particular, the eldest. My nephew's lady will be a most valuable wife. She has all the vulgar spirits of her father and aunt, happily blended with the termagant qualities of her deceased mother. Some peppermint water brouche. How happy is it, Kant, for young ladies in general, that people of quality overlook everything in a marriage contract but their fortune. C'est bien heureux et commode aux filles. Brouche, give me that pamphlet by my bedside. Brush goes for it. Canton, do you wait in the antechamber and let nobody interrupt me till I call you? Much good may do your lordship. And now, Brush, leave me a little to my studies. Exit Brush. Lord Ogleby alone. What can I possibly do among these women here with this confounded rheumatism? It is a most grievous enemy to gallantry and address. Gets off his chair. He, courage, my lord, by heavens, I'm another creature. Hums and dances a little. It will do, faith. Bravo, my lord. These girls have absolutely inspired me. If they are for a game of romps, me voila prit. <laughs> oh, that's an... Sings and dances. Ugly twinge, but it's gone. I have rather too much of the lily this morning in my complexion. A faint tincture of the rose will give a delicate spirit to my eyes for the day. Mm -hmm. Who's there? I won't be disturbed. My lord, my lord, here is Monsieur Sterling to pay his devoir to you this morning, your chambre. Lord Ogilby, softly. What a fellow. Aloud. I am extremely honored by Mr. Sterling. Why don't you see him in, Monsieur? I wish he was at the bottom of his stinking canal. Door opens. Oh, my dear Mr. Sterling, you do me a great deal of honor. Enter Sterling and Lovewell. I hope, my lord. That your lordship slept well in the night? I believe there are no better beds in Europe than I have. I spare no pains to get em, nor money to buy em. His majesty, God bless him, don't sleep on a better out of his palace. And if I had said in, too, I hope no treason, my lord. Your beds are like everything else about you, incomparable. 
they not only make one rest well but give one spirits mr sterling what say you then my lord to another walk in the garden you must see my water by daylight and my walks and my slopes and my clumps and my bridge and my towering trees and my bed of dutch tulips matters looked but dim last night my lord i feel the dew in my great toe but i would put on a cut shoe that i might be able to walk you about i may be laid up to-morrow i pray heaven you may what say you my lord i was saying sir that i was in hopes of seeing the young ladies at breakfast mr sterling they are in my mind the finest tulips in this part of the world <laughs> bravissimo my lord ha <laughs> ha they shall meet your lordship in the garden we won't lose our walk for them i'll take you a little round before breakfast and a larger before dinner and in the evening you shall go the grand tower as i call it <laughs> not a foot i hope mr sterling consider your gout my good friend will certainly be laid by the heels for your politeness ha 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 tis admirable en verite if my young man to love well here would but laugh at my jokes which he ought to do as monsieur does at yours my lord we should be all life and mirth but say you can't will you take my kinsman into your tuition you have certainly the most companionable laugh i ever met with and never out of tune but when your lordship is out of spirits well said can't but here comes my nephew to play his part enter sir john melville i am glad to see your lordship in such spirits this morning i'm sorry to see you do so dull sir what poor things mr sterling these very young fellows are they make love with faces as if they were burying the dead though indeed a marriage sometimes may be properly called a burying of the living eh hey, mr sterling not if they have enough to live upon my lord <laughs> that is all monsieur sterling think of prithee lovewell come with me into the garden i have something of consequence for you and i must communicate it directly we'll go together if your lordship and mr sterling please we'll prepare the ladies to attend you in the garden exeunt sir john and lovewell my girls are always ready i make em rise soon and to bed early their husbands shall have them with good constitutions and good fortunes if they have nothing else my lord fine things mr sterling fine things indeed my lord ah my lord had not you run off your speed in your youth you had not been so crippled in your age my lord very pleasant i protest he <laughs> is monsieur now i suppose is pretty near your lordship standing but having little to eat and little to spend in his own country he'll wear three of your lordship out eating and drinking kills us all very pleasant i protest what a vulgar dog aside my lord so old as me he is sickened to me and look like a boy to pover me <laughs> well said monsieur keep to that and you'll live in any country of the world <laughs> but my lord i will wait upon you into the garden we have but a little time to breakfast i'll go for my hat and cane fetch a little walk with you my lord and then for the hot rolls and butter exit sterling I shall attend you with pleasure. Hot rolls and butter in July. I sweat with the thoughts of it. What a strange beast it is. Sam Barbara. 
he is a vulgar dog and if there was not so much money in the family which i can't do without i would leave him and his hot rolls and butter directly come along monsieur exeunt lord ogleby and canton scene changes to the garden enter sir john melville and lovewell in my room this morning impossible before five this morning i promise you on what occasion i was so anxious to disclose my mind to you that i could not sleep in my bed but i found that you could not sleep neither the bird was flown and the nest long since cold where was you love well pooh prithee ridiculous come now which was it miss sterling's maid a pretty little rogue or miss fanny's abigail a sweet soul too or nay nay leave trifling and tell me your business well but where was you love well walking riding what signifies where i was walking yes i dare say it rained as hard as it could pour sweet refreshing showers to walk in no no love well now would i give twenty pounds to know which of the maids but your business your business sir john let me a little into the secrets of the family Puh. poor love well he can't bear it i see she charged you not to kiss and tell eh love well however though you will not honour me with your confidence i'll venture to trust you with mine what do you think of miss sterling what do i think of miss sterling ay what do you think of her an odd question but i think her a smart lively girl full of mirth and sprightliness all mischief and malice i doubt how but her person what do you think of that pretty and agreeable a little grisette thing what is the meaning of all this i'll tell you you must know love well that notwithstanding all appearances seeing lord ogleby and company we are interrupted when they are gone i'll explain enter lord ogleby sterling mrs heidelberg miss sterling and fanny great improvements indeed mr sterling wonderful improvements the four seasons in lead the flying mercury and the basin with neptune in the middle are all in the very extreme of fine taste you have as many rich figures as the man at hyde park corner the chief pleasure of a country house is to make improvements you know my lord i spare no expense not i this is quite another guest sort of a place than it was when i first took it my lord we were surrounded with trees i cut down above fifty to make the lawn before the house and let in the wind and the sun smack smooth as you see then i made a greenhouse out of the old laundry and turned the brew house into a pinery the high octagon summer house you see yonder is raised on the mast of a ship given me by an east india captain who has turned many a thousand of my money it commands the whole road all the coaches and chariots and chases pass and repass under your eye i'll mount you up there in the afternoon my lord tis the pleasantest place in the world to take a pipe and a bottle and so you shall say my lord ah or a bowl of punch or a can of flip mr sterling for it looks like a cabin in the air if flying chairs were in use the captain might make a voyage to the indies in it still if he had but a fair wind <laughs> my brother's a little comical in his ideas my lord but you'll excuse him i have a little gothic dairy fitted up entirely in my own taste 
in the evening I shall hope for the honour of your lordship's company to take a dish of tea there, or a salabub warm from the cow. I have every moment a fresh opportunity of admiring the elegance of Mrs. Heidelberg, the very flower of delicacy and cream of politeness. Oh, my lord! Oh, madam! How do you like these close walks, my lord? A most excellent serpentine. It forms a perfect maze and winds like a true lover's knot. Ah, there's none of your straight lines here, but all taste, zigzag, crinkum crankum, in and out, right and left, to and again, twisting and turning like a worm, my lord. Admirably laid out, indeed. Mr. Sterling, one can hardly see an inch beyond one's nose anywhere in these walks. You are a most excellent economist of your land, and make a little go a great way. It lies together in as small parcels as if it was placed in pots out at your window in Grace Church Street. <laughs> what you laugh at, Canton? Ah, cassette similitude and stroll. So clever what you say, me lord. Lord Ogleby to Fanny. You seem mightily engaged, madam. What are those pretty hands so busily employed about? Only making up a nosegay, my lord. Will your lordship do me the honour of accepting it? Presenting it. I'll wear it next to my heart, madame. I see the young creature dotes on me. Lord, sister, you've loaded his lordship with a bunch of flowers as big as the cook or the nurse carried to town on Monday morning for Beauport. Will your lordship give me leave to present you with this rose and a sprig of sweetbriar? The truest emblems of yourself, madame. All sweetness and poignancy. A little jealous, poor soul. And now, my lord, if you please, I'll carry you to see my ruins. You'll absolutely fatigue his lordship with overwalking, brother. Not at all, madame. We're in the Garden of Eden, you know, in the region of perpetual spring, youth and beauty. Leering at the women. Quite the man of quality, I protest. Take my arm, me lord. Lord Ogleby leans on him. I'll only show his lordship my ruins, and the cascade, and the Chinese bridge, and then we'll go in to breakfast. Ruins, did you say, Mr. Sterling? Aye, ruins, my lord, and they are reckoned very fine ones, too. You would think them ready to tumble on your head. It has just cost me a hundred and fifty pounds to put my ruins in thorough repair. This way, if your lordship pleases. Lord Ogilby, going, stops. What steeple's that we see yonder? The parish church, I suppose? It is no church at all, my lord. It is a spire that I have built against a tree, a field or two off, to terminate the prospect. One must always have a church or an obelisk or something to terminate the prospect, you know. That's a rule in taste, my lord. Very ingenious indeed. For my part, I desire no finer prospect than this I see before me. <laughs> Leering at the women. Simple, yet varied, bounded, yet extensive. Get away, Canton. Pushing away, Canton. I want no assistance. I'll walk with the ladies. This way, my lord. Lead on, sir. We young folks here will follow you. Madame, Miss Sterling, Miss Fanny, I attend you. Exit after Sterling, gallanting the ladies. He is cock at the game, ma foi. Exit. Manet, Sir John Melville and Lovewell. 
At length, thank heaven, I have an opportunity to unbosom. I know you are faithful, love well, and flatter myself you would rejoice to serve me. Be assured you may depend on me. You must know, then, notwithstanding all appearances, that this treaty of marriage between Miss Sterling and me will come to nothing. How? It will be no match, Lovewell. No match? No. You amaze me. What should prevent it? I. You? Wherefore? I don't like her. Very plain indeed. I never supposed that you were extremely devoted to her from inclination, but thought you always confided it as a matter of convenience rather than affection. Very true. I came into the family without any impressions on my mind, with an unimpassioned indifference ready to receive one woman as soon as another. I looked upon love, serious, sober love, as a chimera, and marriage as a thing, of course, as you know most people do. But I, who was lately so great an infidel in love, am now one of its sincerest votaries. In short, my defection from Miss Sterling proceeds from the violence of my attachment to another. Another? So? So here will be fine work, and pray who is she? Who is she? Who can she be but Fanny, the tender, amiable, engaging Fanny? Fanny? What Fanny? Fanny Sterling. Her sister. Is not she an angel, Lovewell? Her sister? Confusion. You must not think of it, Sir John. Not think of it? I can think of nothing else. Nay, tell me, Lovewell, was it possible for me to be indulged in a perpetual intercourse with two such objects as Fanny and her sister, and not find my heart led by insensible attraction towards her? You seem confounded. Why don't you answer me? Indeed, Sir John, this event gives me infinite concern. Why so? Is not she an angel, Lovewell? I foresee that it must produce the worst consequences. Consider the confusion it must unavoidably create. Let me persuade you to drop these thoughts in time. Never, never, Lovewell. You have gone too far to recede. A negotiation so nearly concluded cannot be broken off with any grace. The lawyers, you know, are hourly expected. The preliminaries almost finally settled between Lord Ogilby and Mr. Sterling, and Miss Sterling herself ready to receive you as a husband. Why, the bans have been published, and nobody has forbidden them, tis true. But you know either of the parties may change their minds even after they enter the church. You think too lightly of this matter? to carry your addresses so far and then to desert her and for her sister too it will be such an affront to the family that they can never put up with it i don't think so for as to my transferring my passion from her to her sister so much the better for then you know i don't carry my affection out of the family Nay, but prithee be serious and think better of it. I have thought better of it already, you see. Tell me honestly, Lovewell, can you blame me? Is there any comparison between them? As to that now, why that is just, just as it may strike different people, there are many admirers of Miss Sterling's vivacity vivacity a medley of cheapside pertness and whitechapel pride no no if i do go so far into the city for a wedding dinner 
it shall be upon turtle at least but i see no probability of success for granting that mr sterling would have consented to it at first he cannot listen to it now why did not you break this affair to the family before under such embarrassed circumstances as i have been can you wonder at my irresolution or perplexity nothing but despair and fear of losing my dear fanny could bring me to a declaration even now and yet i think i know mr sterling so well that strange as my proposal may appear if i can make it advantageous to him as a money transaction as i am sure i can he will certainly come into it but even suppose he should which i very much doubt i don't think fanny herself would listen to your addresses you are deceived a little in that particular you'll find i'm in the right i have some little reason to think otherwise you have not declared your passion to her already yes i have indeed and 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 how did she receive it i think it is not very easy for me to make my address to any woman without receiving some little encouragement encouragement did she give you any encouragement i don't know what you call encouragement but she blushed and cried and desired me not to think of it any more upon which i pressed her hand kissed it swore she was an angel and i could see it tickled her to the soul and did she express no surprise at your declaration why faith to say the truth she was a little surprised and she got away from me too before i could thoroughly explain myself if i should not meet with an opportunity of speaking to her i must get you to deliver a letter from me i a letter i'd rather have nothing nay you promised me your assistance and i am sure you cannot scruple to make yourself useful on such an occasion you may without suspicion acquaint her verbally of my determined affection for her and that i am resolved to ask her father's consent as to that i your commands you know that is if she indeed sir john i think you are in the wrong well well that's my concern ha there she goes by heaven along the walk yonder do you see i'll go to her immediately you are too precipitate consider what you are doing i would not lose this opportunity for the universe nay pray don't go your violence and eagerness may overcome her spirits the shock will be too much for her detaining him nothing shall prevent me ha now she turns into another walk let me go breaks from him i shall lose her going turns back be sure now to keep out of the way if you interrupt us i shall never forgive you exit hastily lovewell alone steph i can't bear this in love with my wife acquaint me with his passion for her make his addresses before my face i shall break out before my time this was the meaning of fanny's uneasiness she could not encourage him i'm sure she could not ha they are turning into the walk and coming this way shall i leave the place leave him to solicit my wife i can't submit to it they come nearer and nearer if i stay it will look suspicious it may betray us and incense him they are here i must go i am the most unfortunate fellow in the world exit enter fanny and sir john leave me sir john i beseech you leave me nay will you persist to follow me with idle solicitations which are an affront to my character and an injury to your own honour i know your delicacy and tremble to offend it but let the urgency of the occasion be my excuse 
consider, madame, that the future happiness of my life depends on my present application to you. Consider that this day must determine my fate, and these are perhaps the only moments left me to incline you to warrant my passion, and to entreat you not to oppose the proposals I mean to open to your father. For shame, for shame, Sir John. Think of your previous engagements. Think of your own situation, and think of mine. What have you discovered in my conduct that might encourage you to so bold a declaration? I am shocked that you should venture to say so much, and blush that I should even dare to give it a hearing. Let me be gone. Nay, stay, madam, but one moment. Your sensibility is too great. Engagements? What engagements have even been pretended on either side than those of family convenience? I went on in the trammels of matrimonial negotiation with a blind submission to your father and Lord Ogilby, but my heart soon claimed a right to be consulted. It has devoted itself to you, and obliges me to plead earnestly for the same tender interest in yours. Have a care, Sir John. Do not mistake a depraved will for a virtuous inclination. By these common pretenses of the heart, half of our sex are made fools, and a greater part of yours despise them for it. Affection, you will allow, is involuntary. We cannot always direct it to the object on which it should fix. But when it is once inviolably attached, inviolably as mine is to you, it often creates reciprocal affection. When I last urged you on this subject, you heard me with more temper, and I hoped with some compassion. You deceived yourself. If I forbore to exert a proper spirit, nay, if I did not even express the quickest resentment of your behavior, it was only in consideration of that respect I wish to pay you in honor to my sister. And be assured, sir, woman as I am, that my vanity could reap no pleasure from a triumph that must result from the blackest treachery to her. Going. One word and I have done stopping her. Your impatience and anxiety and the urgency of the occasion oblige me to be brief and explicit with you. I appeal, therefore, from your delicacy to your justice. Your sister, I verily believe, neither entertains any real affection for me or tenderness for you. Your father, I am inclined to think, is not much concerned, by means of which his daughters, the families, are united. Now, as they cannot, shall not be connected, otherwise than by my union with you. Why will you, from a false delicacy, oppose a measure so conductive to my happiness, and I hope your own? I love you, most passionately and sincerely love you, and hope to propose terms agreeable to Mr. Sterling. If then you don't absolutely loathe, abhor, and scorn me, if there is no other happier man... Hear me, sir. Hear my final determination. Were my father and sister as insensible as you are pleased to represent them, were my heart forever to remain disengaged to any other... I could not listen to your proposals. What, you on the very eve of a marriage with my sister, I, living under the same roof with her, bound not only by the laws of friendship and hospitality, but even the ties of blood to contribute to her happiness, and not to conspire against her peace, the peace of a whole family, and that my own, too, away, Away, Sir John! At such a time, and in such circumstances, your addresses only inspire me with horror. Nay, you must detain me no longer. I will go. Do not leave me in absolute despair. Give me a glimpse of hope. Falling on his knees. I cannot. Pray, Sir John. Struggling to go. Shall this hand be given to another? Kissing her hand. No, I cannot endure it. 
my whole soul is yours, and the whole happiness of my life is in your power. Enter Miss Sterling. Ha! My sister is here. Rise for shame, Sir John. Miss Sterling. Rising. I beg your pardon, sir. You'll excuse me, madame. I have broken upon you a little unopportunely, I believe. But I did not mean to interrupt you. I only came, sir, to let you know that breakfast awaits. If you have finished your morning's devotions. I am very sensible, Miss Sterling, that this may appear particular, but... Oh, dear Sir John, don't put yourself through the trouble of an apology. The thing explains itself. It will soon, madam. In the meantime, I can only assure you of my profound respect and esteem for you, and make no doubt of convincing Mr. Sterling of the honour and integrity of my intentions, and... And your humble servant, madam. Exit in confusion. Manet, Fanny and Miss Sterling. Respect? Insolence? Esteem? Very fine, truly. And you, madam, my sweet, delicate, innocent, sentimental sister, will you convince my papa too of the integrity of your intentions? Do not upbraid me, my dear sister. Indeed, I don't deserve it. Believe me, you can't be more offended at his behavior than I am, and I am sure it cannot make you half so miserable. Make me miserable? You are mightily deceived, madame. It gives me no sort of uneasiness, I assure you. A base fellow. As for you, miss, the pretended softness of your disposition, your artful good nature, never imposed upon me. I always knew you to be fly and envious and deceitful. Indeed, you wrong me. Oh, you are all goodness to be sure. Did not I find him on his knees before you? Did I not see him kiss your sweet hand? Did I not hear his protestations? Was I not witness to your disassembled modesty? No, no, my dear. Don't imagine that you can make a fool of your elder sister so easily. Sir John, I own, is to blame. But I am above the thoughts of doing you the least injury. We shall try that, madam. I hope, miss, you'll be able to give a better account to my papa and my aunt for they shall both know of this matter, I promise you. Exit. Fanny alone. How unhappy I am. My distresses multiply upon me. Mr. Lovewell must now become acquainted with Sir John's behaviour to me, and in a manner that may add to his uneasiness. My father, instead of being disposed by fortunate circumstances to forgive any transgression, will be previously incensed against me. My sister and my aunt will become irreconcilably my enemies and rejoice in my disgrace. Yet, at all events, I am determined on a discovery. I dread it and am resolved to hasten it. It is surrounded with more horrors every instant as it appears every instant more necessary. Exit. End of Act Two. Act Three of The Clandestine Marriage by David Garrick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three. Scene One A Hall. Enter a servant leading in Sergeant Flower, and counsellors Traverse and Truman, all booted. This way, if you please, gentlemen. My master is at breakfast with the family at present, but I'll let him know, and he will wait on you immediately. Mighty well, young man, mighty well. Please to favour me with your names, gentlemen. Let Mr. Sterling know that Mr. Sergeant Flower and two other gentlemen of the bar I come to wait on him according to his appointment. I will, sir. Going. And harky, young man. 
Servant returns. Desire my servant, Mr. Sergeant Flower's servant, to bring in my green and gold battlecloth and pistols, and lay them down here in the hall with my portmanteau. I will, sir. Exit. Well, gentlemen, the setting these marriage articles falls conveniently enough, almost just on the eve of the circuits. Let me see. The home, the midland, and western. Ay, we can all cross the country well enough to our several destinations. Travers, when do you begin at Hertford? The day after tomorrow. Well, that is commission day with us at Warwick, too. But my clerk has retainers for every cause in the paper, so it will be time enough if I am there the next morning. Besides, I have about half a dozen cases that have lain by me ever since the spring offices, and I must tack opinions to them before I see my country clients again. So I will take the evening before me, and then a currente calamo, as I say, eh, Travers? True, Mr. Sergeant, and the easiest thing in the world, too. For those country attorneys are such ignorant dogs that in case of the device of an estate to A and his heirs for ever, they'll make a query whether he takes it in fee or in tail. Do you expect to have much to do on the home circuit, these exercises? Not much neasy prius business, but a good deal on the crown side, I believe. The girls are brimful, and some of the felons in good circumstances and likely to be tolerable of clients. Let me see. I'm engaged for three highway robberies, two murders, one forgery, and half a dozen larcenies at Kingston. A pretty decent go delivery. Do you expect to bring off Darkin for the robbery on Putney Common? Can you make out your alibi? Oh, no. The Crown witnesses are sure to prove our identity. We shall certainly be hanged. But that don't signify. But, Mr. Sergeant, have you much to do? Any remarkable cause on Midland this circuit? Nothing very remarkable, except two rapes and Ryder and Westering at Nottingham for Crimcon. But on the whole, I believe a good deal of business. Our associate tells me there are above thirty veneers for work. Pray, Mr. Sergeant, are you concerned in Jones and Thomas at Lincoln? I am, for the plaintiff. And what do you think on't? A non-suit. He thought so. Oh, no manner of doubt on it. Lucicarius, we have no right in it. We have but one chance. What's that? Why, my Lord Chief does not go with circuit this time, and my brother Puzzle being in the commission, the cause will come on before him. Aye, that may do indeed if you can but throw dust in the eyes of the defendant's counsel. True. Mr. Truman, I think you are concerned for Lord Ogilby in this affair. To Truman. I am, sir. I have the honour to be related to his lordship, and hold some courts for him in Somersetshire. Go the Western Circuit, and attend the sessions at Exeter, merely because his lordship's interest and property lie in that part of the kingdom. Ha! And pray, Mr. Truman, how long have you been called to the bar? About nine years and three quarters. Ha! I don't know that I ever had the pleasure of seeing you before. I wish you success, young gentleman. Enter Sterling. Ah, Mr. Sergeant Flower, I am glad to see you. Your servant, Mr. Sergeant. Gentlemen, your servant. Well, are all matters concluded? Has that snail-paced conveyancer, old ferret of Gray's Inn, settled the articles at last? Do you approve of what he has done? Will his tackle hold, tight and strong? Eh, Master Sergeant? My friend ferret, slow and sure, sir. But then, serious out citious, as we say. Sooner or later, Mr. Sterling, he is sure to put his business out of hand, as he should do. My clerk has brought the writings and all the other instruments along with him, and the settlement is, I believe, as good a settlement as any settlement on the face of the earth. But that damned mortgage of sixty thousand pounds. There don't appear to be any other encumbrances, I hope. He can answer for that, sir. 
and that will be cleared off immediately on the payment of the first part of Miss Sterling's portion. You would agree, on your part, to come down with eighty thousand shillings. Down on the nail. Aye, aye. My money is ready tomorrow, if he pleases. He shall have it in India bonds, or notes, or how he chooses. Your lords and your dukes, and your people at the court end of the town, stick at payments sometimes. Debts unpaid, no credit lost with them, but no fear of us substantial fellows, eh, Mr. Sergeant? Sir John, having last term, according to agreement, levied a fine, and suffered a recovery, has thereby cut off the entail of the Ogilby estate for the better effecting the purposes of the present intended marriage, on which above-mentioned Ogilby estate, a jointure of two thousand pound per annum, is secured to your eldest daughter, now Elizabeth Sterling, spinster, and the whole estate, after the death of the aforesaid earl, descends to the heirs male of Sir John Melville on the body of the aforesaid Elizabeth Sterling, lawfully to be begotten. Very true, and Sir John is to be put in immediate possession of as much of his lordship's Somersetshire estate as lies in the manners of Hogmore and Cranford, amounting to between two and three thousands per annum, and to the death of Mr. Sterling a further sum of seventy thousand, Enter Sir John Melville. Ah, Sir John, here we are, hard at it, paving the road to matrimony. First the lawyers, then comes the doctor. Let us but dispatch the long robe. We shall soon set pudding sleeves to work, I warrant you. I am sorry to interrupt you, sir, but I hope that both you and these gentlemen will excuse me having something very particular for your private ear. I took the liberty of following you, and beg you will oblige me with an audience immediately. Aye, with all my heart. A gentleman, a Mr. Sergeant, a you'll excuse it. Business must be done, you know. The writings will keep cold till tomorrow morning. I must be at Warwick, Mr. Sterling, the day after. Nay, nay. I shan't part with you to-night, gentlemen, I promise you. My house is very full, but I have beds for you all, beds for your servants, and stabling for all your horses. Will you take a turn in the garden and view some of my improvements before dinner? Or will you amuse yourselves on the green with a game of bowls and a cool tankard? My servants shall attend to you. Do you choose any other refreshment? Call for what you please. Do as you please. Make yourselves quite at home, I beg of you. Here, Thomas, Harry, William, wait on these gentlemen. Follows the lawyers out, bawling and talking, and then returns to Sir John. And now, sir, I am entirely at your service. What are your commands with me, Sir John? After having assented so readily to all your proposals, as well as received so many instances of your cheerful compliance with the demands made on our part, I am extremely concerned, Mr. Sterling, to be the involuntary cause of any uneasiness. Uneasiness? What uneasiness? Where business is transacted as it ought to be, and the parties understand one another... There can be no uneasiness. You agree, on such and such conditions, to receive my daughter for a wife. On the same conditions, I agree to receive you as a son-in-law. And as to all the rest, it follows, of course, you know, as regularly as the payment of a bill after acceptance. Pardon me, sir. More uneasiness has arisen than you are aware of. I am myself, at this instant, in a state of inexpressible embarrassment. Miss Sterling, I know, is extremely disconcerted too, and unless you will oblige me with the assistance of your friendship, I foresee the speedy progress of discontent and animosity through the whole family. What the deuce is all this? I don't understand a single syllable. In one word, then. It will be absolutely impossible for me to fulfil my engagements in regard to Miss Sterling. How, oh, Sir John? 
Do you mean to put an affront upon my family? What? Refuse to? Be assured, sir, that I neither mean to affront nor forsake your family. My only fear is that you should desert me, for the whole happiness of my life depends on my being connected with your family by the nearest and tenderest ties in the world. Why did you not tell me but a moment ago that it was absolutely impossible for you to marry my daughter? True, but you have another daughter, sir. Well? Who has obtained the most absolute dominion over my heart? I have already declared my passion to her. Nay, Miss Sterling herself is also apprised of it. And if you will but give a sanction to my present address, the uncommon merit of Miss Sterling will no doubt recommend her to a person of equal, if not superior, rank to myself and our families may still be allied by my union with Miss Fanny. Mighty fine, truly. Why, what the plague do you make of us, Sir John? Do you come to market for my daughters, like servants at a statute fair? Do you think that I would suffer you, or any man in the world, to come into my house like the Grand Seigneur, and toss the handkerchief first to one and then to another, just as he pleases? Do you think I drive a kind of African slave trade with them? and a moment's patience sir nothing but the excess of my passion for miss fanny should have introduced me to take any step that had the least appearance of disrespect to any part of your family and even now i am desirous to atone for my transgression by making the most adequate compensation that lies in my power compensation what compensation can you possibly make in such a case as this, Sir John? Come, come, Mr. Sterling. I know you to be a man of sense, a man of business, a man of the world. I'll deal frankly with you, and you shall see that I do not desire a change of measures for my own gratification without endeavouring to make it advantageous to you. What advantage can your inconstancy be to me, Sir John? I'll tell you, sir, you know that by the articles at present subsisting between us, on the day of my marriage with Miss Sterling, you agree to pay the gross sum of eighty thousand pounds? Well? Now, if you will, but content to my waiving that marriage. I agree to your waiving that marriage? Impossible, Sir John. I hope not, sir, as on my part... I will agree to waive my right to thirty thousand pounds of the fortune I was to receive with her. Thirty thousand, do you say? Yes, sir, and accept of Miss Fanny with fifty thousand instead of fourscore. Fifty thousand? Instead of fourscore. Why, why, there may be something in that. Let me see. Fanny with fifty thousand instead of Betsy with four score. But how can this be, Sir John? For, you know, I am to pay this money into the hands of my Lord Ogilby, who, I believe, between you and me, Sir John, is not overstocked with ready money at present. And three score thousand of it, you know, is to go to pay off the present encumbrances on the estate, Sir John. That objection is easily obviated. Ten of the twenty thousand, which would remain as a surplus of the fourscore, after paying off the mortgage, was intended by his lordship for my use, that we might set off with some little éclat on our marriage, and the other ten for his own. Ten thousand pounds, therefore, I shall be able to pay you immediately, and for the remaining twenty thousand you shall have a mortgage on that part of the estate, which is to be made over to me, with whatever security you shall require for the regular payment of the interest, till the principal is duly discharged. Why, to do you justice, Sir John, there is something fair and open in your proposal. And since I find you do not mean to put an affront upon the family... Nothing was ever farther from my thoughts, Mr. Sterling, 
and after all, the whole affair is nothing extraordinary. Such things happen every day, and as the world has only heard generally of a treaty between the families, when this marriage takes place, nobody will be the wiser if we have but discretion enough to keep our own counsel. True, true. And since you only transfer from one girl to the other, it is no more than transferring so much stock, you know. The very thing. Odd so. I had quite forgot. We are reckoning without our host here. There is another difficulty. You alarm me. What can that be? I can't stir a step in this business without consulting my sister Heidelberg. The family has very great expectations from her, and we must not give her any offence. But if you come into this measure, surely she will be so kind as to consent. I don't know that. Betsy is her darling, and I can't tell how far she may resent any slight that seems to be offered to her favorite niece. However, I'll do the best I can for you. You shall go and break the matter to her first, and by that time that I suppose that your rhetoric has prevailed upon her to listen to reason, I will step in to reinforce your arguments. I'll fly to her immediately. You promise me your assistance? I do. Ten thousand thanks for it. And now, success attend me. Going. Harky, Sir John. Sir John returns. Not a word of the thirty thousand to my sister, Sir John. Oh, I am dumb. I am dumb, sir. Going. You remember it is thirty thousand? To be sure, I do. But, uh, Sir John, one thing more. Sir John returns. My lord must know nothing of this stroke of friendship between us. Not for the world. Let me alone. Let me alone. Offering to go. Sterling holding him. And, when everything is agreed... We must give each other a bond to be held fast to the bargain. To be sure, a bond by all means, a bond or whatever you please. Exit hastily. Sterling alone. I should have thought of more conditions. He's in a humour to give me everything. Why, what mere children are your fellows of quality, that cry for a plaything one minute and throw it by the next, as changeable as the weather? and as uncertain as the stocks. Special fellows to drive a bargain, and yet they are to take care of the interest of the nation truly. Where does this whirligig man of fashion offer to give up thirty thousand pounds in hard money, with as much indifference as if it was a china orange? By this mortgage I shall have a hold on his terra firma, and if he wants more money, as he certainly will, let him have children by my daughter or no, I shall have his whole estate in a net for the benefit of my family. Well, thus it is, that the children of citizens who have acquired fortunes prove persons of fashion, and thus it is, that persons of fashion who have ruined their fortunes reduce the next generation to sits. Exit. Scene changes to another apartment. Enter Mrs. Heidelberg and Miss Sterling. This is your gentle-looking, soft-speaking, sweet-smiling, affable Miss Fanny for you. My Miss Fanny, I disclaim her. With all her arts, she never could insinuate herself into my good graces. And yet she has a way with her that deceives man, woman, and child, except you and me, niece. Oh, ay, she wants nothing but a crook in her hand and a lamb under her arm to be a perfect picture of innocence and simplicity. Just as I was drawn at Amsterdam when I went over to visit my husband's relations. And then she's so mighty good to the servants. Pray, John, do this. Pray, Tom, do that. Thank you, Jenny. And then so humble to her relations. 
To be sure, Papa, as my aunt pleases, my sister knows best, but with all her demureness and humility, she has no objection to be Lady Melville, it seems, nor to any wickedness that can make her so. She, Lady Melville, compose yourself, niece. I Lady her indeed, a little creepin' canton. She shan't be the better for a farden of my money. But tell me, child, how does this intriguing with Sir John correspond with her partiality to Lovewell? I don't see a concatenation here. There I was deceived, madame. I took all their whisperings and stealing into corners to be the mere attraction of vulgar minds. But behold, their private meetings were not to contrive their own insipid happiness, but to conspire against mine. But I know whence proceeds Mr. Lovewell's resentment to me. I could not stoop to be familiar with my father's clerk, and so I have lost his interest. My spirit to a tea, my dear child. Kissing her. Mr. Heidelberg lost his election for Member of Parliament because I would not demean myself to be slobbered about by drunken shoemakers, beastly cheesemongers, and greasy butchers and tallow chandlers. However, niece, I can't help differing a little in opinion from you in this matter. My experience and sagacity makes me still suspect that there is something more between her and that love well, notwithstanding this affair of Sir John. I had my eye upon them the whole time of breakfast. Sir John, I observed, looked a little confounded, indeed, though I knew nothing of what had passed in the garden. You seem to sit upon thorns, too. But Fanny and Mr. Lovewell made quite another guess sort of a figure, and were as perfect a picture of two distressed lovers as if it had been drawn by Raphael Angelo. As to Sir John and Fanny, I want a matter of fact. Matter of fact, madame, did I not come unexpectedly upon them? Was not Sir John kneeling at her feet and kissing her hand? Did not he look all love and she all confusion? Is not the matter of fact, and did not Sir John, the moment that Papa was called out of the room to the lawyer men, get up from breakfast and follow him immediately? And I warrant you that by this time he has made proposals to him to marry my sister. Oh, that some other person, an earl or a duke, would make his addresses to me, that I might be revenged on this monster. Be cool, child. You shall be Lady Melville, in spite of all their cablins, if it cost me ten thousand pounds to turn the scale. Sir John may apply to my brother, indeed, but I'll make them all know who governs in this family. As I live, madame, yonder comes Sir John, a base man. I can't endure the sight of him. I'll leave the room this instant. Disordered. Poor thing. Well, retire to your own chamber, child. I'll give it him, I warrant you, and by and by I'll come and let you know all that has passed between us. Pray do, madame. Looking back. A vile wretch. Exit in a rage. Enter Sir John Melville. Your most obedient, humble servant, madam. Bowing very respectfully. Your servant, Sir John. Dropping a half curtsy and pouting. Miss Sterling's manner of quitting the room on my approach and the visible coolness of your behaviour to me, madam, convince me that she has acquainted you with what passed this morning. I am very sorry, Sir John, to be made acquainted with anything that should induce me to change the opinion which I could always wish to entertain of a person of quality. 
pouting. It has always been my ambition to merit the best opinion from Mrs. Heidelberg, and when she comes to weigh all circumstances, I flatter myself. You do flatter yourself if you imagine that I can approve of your behaviour to my niece, Sir John, and give me leave to tell you, Sir John, that you have been drawn into an action much beneath you, Sir John, and that I look upon every injury offered to Miss Betty Sterling as an affront to myself, Sir John. Warmly. I would not offend you for the world, madam, but when I am influenced by a partiality for another, however ill-founded, I hope your discernment and good sense will think it rather a point of honour to renounce engagements, which I could not fulfil so strictly as I ought, and that you will excuse the change in my inclinations, since the new object, as well as the first, has the honour of being your niece, madam. I disclaim her as a niece, Sir John. Miss Sterling disclaims her as a sister, and the whole family must disclaim her for her monstrous baseness and treachery. Indeed, she has been guilty of none, madam. Her hand and heart are, I am sure, entirely at the disposal of yourself and Mr. Sterling. Enter Sterling behind. And if you should not oppose my inclinations, I am sure of Mr. Sterling's consent, madam. Indeed. Quite certain, madam. Sterling behind. So, they seem to be coming to terms already. I may venture to make my appearance. To marry Fanny? Sterling advances by degrees. Yes, madam. My brother has given his consent, you say? In the most ample manner, with no other restriction than the failure of your concurrence, madam. C. Sterling. Oh, here's Mr. Sterling, who will confirm what I have told you. What? Have you consented to give up your own daughter in this manner, brother? Give her up? No, not give her up, sister. Only in case that you... Zunes, I am afraid you have said too much, Sir John. Apart to Sir John. Yes, yes. I see now that it is true enough what my niece told me. You are all plotting and cabling against her. Pray, does Lord Ogleby know of this affair? I have not yet made him acquainted with it, madam. No, I warrant you, I thought so. And so his lordship and myself truly are not to be consulted till the last. What? Did you not consult my lord? Oh, fie for shame, Sir John. Nay, but Mr. Sterling... We, who are the persons of most consequence and experience in the two families, are to know nothing of the matter till the whole is as good as concluded upon. But his lordship, I am sure, will have more generosity than to countenance such a proceeding, and I could not have expected such behaviour from a person of your quality, Sir John. As for you, brother... Nay, nay, but hear me, sister. I am perfectly ashamed of you. Have you no spirit, no more concern for the honour of our family than to consent? Consent? I consent? As I hope for mercy, I never gave my consent. Did I consent, Sir John? Not absolutely, without Mrs. Heidelberg's concurrence, but in case of her approbation. Aye, I grant you, if my sister approved. But that's quite another thing, you know. To Mrs. Heidelberg. Your sister approve, indeed. I thought you know her better, Brother Sterling. What? Approve of having your eldest daughter returned upon your hands and exchanged for the younger? I am surprised how you could listen to such a scandalous proposal. I tell you, 
I never did listen to it. Did I not say that I would be governed entirely by my sister, Sir John? And unless she agreed to your marrying Fanny... I agree to his marrying Fanny? Abominable! The man is absolutely out of his senses. Can't that wise head of yours foresee the consequence of all this, Brother Sterling? Will Sir John take Fanny without a fortune? No. After you have settled the largest part of your property on your youngest daughter, can there be an equal portion left for the eldest? No. Does not this overturn the whole system of the family? Yes, yes, yes. You know I was always for my niece Betsy's marrying a person of the very first quality. That was my maxim, and therefore much the largest settlement was of course to be made upon her. As for Fanny, if she could, with a fortune of twenty or thirty thousand pounds, get a knight or a member of parliament, or a rich common councilman for a husband, I thought it might do very well. But if a better match should offer itself, why should not it be accepted, madam? At the expense of her elder sister? Oh, fie, Sir John! How could you bear to hear of such an indignity, Brother Sterling? I? Nay, I shan't hear of it, I promise you. I can't hear of it indeed, Sir John. But you have heard of it, Brother Sterling. You know you have, and sent Sir John to propose it to me. But if you can give up your daughter, I shan't forsake my niece, I assure you. Ah, if my poor dear Mr. Heidelberg and our sweet babes had been alive, he would not have behaved so. Did I, Sir John? Nay, speak. Bring me off, or we are ruined. Apart to Sir John. Why, to be sure, to speak the truth? To speak the truth. I am ashamed of you both. But have a care what you are about, brother. Have a care, I say. The lawyers are in the house, I hear. And if everything is not settled to my liking, I'll have nothing more to say to you if I live these hundred years. I'll go over to Holland and settle with Mr. Van der Spracken, my poor husband's first cousin, and my own family shall never be the better for a farden of my money, I promise you. Exit. Manant, Sir John and Stirling. I thought so. I knew she never would agree to it. Steth, how unfortunate. What can we do, Mr. Sterling? Nothing. What? Must our agreement break off the moment it is made, then? It can't be helped, Sir John. The family, as I told you before, have great expectations from my sister. And if this matter proceeds, you hear yourself that she threatens to leave us. My brother Heidelberg was a warm man, a very warm man, and died worth a plum at least. A plum, aye, I warrant you, he died worth a plum and a half. Well, but if I... And then, my sister has three or four very good mortgages, a deal of money in the three per cents, and old South Sea annuities, besides large concerns in the Dutch and French funds. The greatest part of all this she means to leave to our family. I can only say, sir. Why, your offer of the difference of thirty thousand was very fair and handsome, to be sure, Sir John. Nay, but I'm even willing to... Aye, but if I was to accept it against her will, I might lose above a hundred thousand. So, you see, the balance is against you, Sir John. But is there no way, do you think, of prevailing on Mrs. Heidelberg to grant her consent? I am afraid not. However, when her passion is a little abated, for she's very passionate, you may try what can be done. But you must not use my name any more, Sir John. 
Suppose I was to prevail on Lord Ogilby to apply to her. Do you think that would have any influence over her? I think he would be more likely to persuade her to it than any other person in the family. She has a great respect for Lord Ogilby. She loves the Lord. I'll apply to him this very day, and if he should prevail on Mrs. Heidelberg, I may depend on your friendship, Mr. Sterling. Aye, aye. I shall be glad to oblige you when it is in my power. But, as the account stands now, you see it is not upon the figures. And so, your servant, Sir John. Exit. Sir John Melville alone. What a situation am I in, breaking off with her whom I was bound by treaty to marry, rejected by the object of my affections, and embroiled with this turbulent woman who governs the whole family, and yet opposition, instead of smothering, increases my inclination. I must have her. I'll apply immediately to Lord Ogilby. And if he can but bring over the aunt to our party, her influence will overcome the scruples and delicacy of my dear Fanny, and I shall be the happiest of mankind. Exit. End of Act Three. Act Four of The Clandestine Marriage by David Garrick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One. A room. Enter Sterling, Mrs. Heidelberg, and Miss Sterling. What? Will you send Fanny to town, sister? Tomorrow morning. I've given orders about it already. Indeed. Positively. But consider, sister, at such a time as this, what an odd appearance it will have. Not half so odd as her behaviour, brother. This time was intended for happiness, and I'll keep no incendiaries here to destroy it. I insist on her going off tomorrow morning. I'm afraid this is all you're doing, Betsy. No, indeed, Papa. My aunt knows that it is not. For all Fanny's basis to me, I am sure I would not do or say anything to hurt her with you or my aunt for the world. Hold your tongue, Betsy. I will have my way. When she is packed off, everything will go on as it should do. Since they are at their intrigues, I'll let them see that we can act with vigour on our part, and the sending her out of the way shall be the preliminary step to all the rest of my proceedings. Well, but, sister... It does not signify talking, Brother Sterling, for I'm resolved to be rid of her, and I will. Come along, child. To Miss Sterling... The post chaise shall be at the door by six o'clock in the morning, and if Miss Fanny does not get into it, why, I will, and so there's an end of the matter. Bounces out with Miss Sterling. Mrs. Heidelberg returns. One word more, Brother Sterling. I expect that you will take your eldest daughter in your hand and make a formal complaint to Lord Ogilby of Sir John Meville's behaviour. Do this, brother. Show a proper regard for the honour of your family yourself, and I shall throw in my might to the raising of it. If not, but now you know my mind, so act as you please, and take the consequences. Exit. Sterling alone. The devil's in the woman for tyranny. Mothers, wives, mistresses, or sisters. They always will govern us. As to my sister Heidelberg, she knows the strength of her purse and domineers upon the credit of it. I will do this, and you shall do that, and you must do the other. Or else the family shan't have a farden of it. Mimicking. 
<sighs> so absolute with her money. But, to say the truth, nothing but money can make us absolute. And so we must even make the best of her. Scene changes to the garden. Enter Lord Ogilby and Canton. What? Mademoiselle Fanny to be sent away? Why? Wherefore? What's the meaning of all this? Je ne sais pas. I know nothing of it. It can't be. It shan't be. I protest against the measure. She's a fine girl, and I had much rather that the rest of the family were annihilated than that she should leave us. Her vulgar father, that's the very abstract of Change Alley, the aunt that's always endeavoring to be a fine lady, and the pert sister forever showing that she is one our horrid company indeed and without her would be intolerable ah la petite fanchon she's the thing isn't she tant there is very good sympathy entre vous and that young lady milor I'll not be left among these Goths and Vandals, your Stirlings, your Heidelbergs and Devilbergs. If she goes, I'll positively go too. In the same poche, milor? You have no object to that, I believe, nor Mademoiselle neither, too. Ha <laughs> ha ha! Prithee, hold thy foolish tongue, Kant. Does thy Swiss stupidity imagine? that I can see and talk with a fine girl without desires? My eyes are involuntarily attracted by beautiful objects. I fly as naturally to a fine girl. As the fine girl to you, my lord, ha <laughs> ha you fly together like un pair de pigeons. Like un pair de pigeons. Mocks him. Vous êtes un sort, Monsieur Canton. Thou art always dreaming of my intrigues, and never cease to me madden. But you suspect mischief, you old fool, you. I am fool, I confess, but not always fool in that, my lord. Hey, hey, hey. He, 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 thou art incorrigible, but thy absurdities amuse one. Thou art like my rapi here. Takes out his box. A most ridiculous superfluity, but a pinch of thee now, and then is a more delicious treat. You do me great honour, milor. Tis fact upon my soul, thou art properly my kephalic snuff, and art no bad medicine against migraines, vertigos, and profound thinking. <laughs> Your flattery, milor, will make me too proud. The girl has some little partiality for me, to be sure. But prithee, Kant, is not that Miss Fanny yonder? En vérité, tis she, milord. Tis one of the pigeons, the pigeons d'amour. Don't be ridiculous, you old monkey. Smiling. I am monkey, I am O, but I have eye, I have ear, and a little understand, now and then. Ta fais vous bête. Elle vous entend, milor. She will make a love to you. Will she? Have at her, then. A fine girl can't oblige me more. Egad, I find myself a little... Ajoué. Come along, Kant. She is but in the next walk. But there is such a deal of this damned crinkum crackum, as Sterling calls it, that one sees people for half an hour before one can get to them. Allons, Monsieur Canton, allons donc. Exeunt singing in French. Another part of the garden. Lovewell and Fanny. My dear Fanny, I cannot bear your distress. It overcomes all my resolutions, and I am prepared for the discovery. But how can it be effected before my departure? I'll tell you. Lord Ogilby seems to entertain a visible partiality for you. 
and notwithstanding the peculiarities of his behaviour i am sure that he is humane at the bottom he is vain to an excess but withal extremely good-natured and would do anything to recommend himself to a lady do you open the whole affair of our marriage to him immediately it will come with more irresistible persuasion from you than from myself and i doubt not but you'll gain his friendship and protection at once his influence and authority will put an end to sir john's solicitations remove your aunt's and sister's unkindness and suspicions and i hope reconcile your father and the whole family to our marriage heaven grant it where is my lord i have heard him and canton since dinner singing french songs under the great walnut tree by the parlour door if you meet with him in the garden you may disclose the whole immediately dreadful as the task is i'll do it anything is better than this continual anxiety by that time the discovery is made i will appear to second you ah here comes my lord now my dear fanny summon up all your spirits plead our cause powerfully and be sure of success going ah oh, don't leave me nay you must let me well since it must be so i'll obey you if i have the power oh love well consider our situation is very critical to-morrow morning is fixed for your departure and if we lose this opportunity we may wish in vain for another he approaches i must retire speak my dear fanny speak and make us happy exit fanny alone good heaven what a situation am i in what shall i do what shall i say to him i am all confusion enter lord ogleby and canton to see so much beauty so solitary madam is a satire upon mankind and tis fortunate that one man has broken upon your reverie for the credit of our sex i say one madam for poor canton canton here from age and infirmities stands for nothing nothing at all indeed your lordship does me great honour i had a favour to request my lord a favour madam to be honoured with your commands is an inexpressible favour done to me madam if your lordship would indulge me with the honour of a moment's what is the matter with me aside the girl's confused <laughs> here's something in the wind faith i'll have a tete -tete with her elle est vous to canton i go ah poor mademoiselle milor have pity upon the poor pigeon i'll knock you down count if you're impertinent smiling then i must obey shuffles along you are most pleased for all that aside and exit i shall sink with apprehension aside what a sweet girl she's a civilized being and atones for the barbarism of the rest of the family my lord i she curtsies and blushes lord ogleby addressing her i look upon it madam to be one of the luckiest circumstances of my life that i have this moment the honour of receiving your commands and the satisfaction of confirming with my tongue what my eyes perhaps have but too weakly expressed that i am literally the humblest of your servants i think myself greatly honoured by your lordship's partiality to me but it distresses me that i am obliged in my present situation to apply to it for protection i am happy in your distress madam because it gives me an opportunity to show my zeal beauty to me is a religion in which i was born and bred read a bigot and would die a martyr i'm in tolerable spirit faith 
aside. There is not perhaps at this moment a more distressed creature than myself. Affection, duty, hope, despair, and a thousand different sentiments are struggling in my bosom, and even the presence of your lordship, to whom I have flown for protection, adds to my perplexity. Does it, madam? Venus forbid! My old fault, the devil's in me, I think, for perplexing young women. Aside and smiling. Take courage, madam. Dear Miss Fanny, explain. You have a powerful advocate in my breast, I assure you. My heart, madam, I am attached to you by all the laws of sympathy and delicacy. By my honor, I am. Then I will venture to unburthen my mind. Sir John Melville, my lord, by the most misplaced and mistimed declaration of affection for me, has made me the unhappiest of women. How, madam, has Sir John made his addresses to you? He has, my lord, in the strongest terms. But I hope it is needless to say that my duty to my father, love to my sister, and regard to the whole family, as well as the great respect I entertain for your lordship, curtsying, made me shudder at his addresses. Charming girl, proceed, my dear Miss Fanny, proceed. In a moment, give me leave, my lord. But if what I have to disclose should be received with anger or displeasure... Impossible! By all the tender powers, speak! I beseech you, or I shall divine the cause before you utter it. Then, my lord, Sir John's addresses are not only shocking to me in themselves, but are more particularly disagreeable to me at this time as... as... Hesitating. As what, madam? As... Uh, pardon my confusion... I am entirely devoted to another. If this is not plain, the devil's in it. Aside. But tell me, my dear Miss Fanny, for I must know. Tell me the how, the when, and the where. Tell me. And to Canton hastily. Amilor, Amilor, Amilor. Damn your Swiss impertinence. How Durst you interrupt me in the most critical melting moment that ever love and beauty honoured me with? I demand a pardon, milor. Sir John Melville, milor, sent me to beg you to do him the honour to speak a little to your lordship. I am not at leisure. I am busy. Get away, you stupid old dog, you Swiss rascal, or I'll... For bien, milor. Canton goes out tiptoeing. By the laws of gallantry, madam, this interruption should be death. But is no punishment ought to disturb the triumph of the softer passions. The criminal is pardoned and dismissed. Let us return, madam, to the highest luxury of exalted minds, a declaration of love from the lips of beauty. The entrance of a third person has a little relieved me. But I cannot go through with it, and yet I must open my heart with a discovery, or it will break with its burthen. What passion in her eyes! I am alarmed to agitation. Aside. I presume, madam, and as you have flattered me by making me a party concerned, I hope you'll excuse the presumption that— do you excuse my making you a party concerned, my lord, and let me interest your heart in my behalf, as my future happiness or misery in a great measure depend? Upon me, madam? Upon you, my lord. Oh, there's no standing this. I have caught the infection. Her tenderness dissolves me. And should you too feverly judge of a rash action which passion prompted and modesty has long concealed? Taking her hand. Thou amiable creature, command my heart, for it is vanquished. Speak but thy virtuous wishes, and enjoy them. I cannot, my lord, 
Indeed, I cannot. Mr. Lovewell must tell you my distresses, and when you know them, pity and protect me. Exit in tears. Lord Ogleby alone. How the devil could I bring her to this? Is it too much? Too much? I can't bear it. I must give way to this amiable weakness. Wipes his eyes. My heart overflows with sympathy, and I feel every tenderness I have inspired. How blind have I been to the desolation I have made! How could I possibly imagine that a little partial attention and tender civilities to this young creature should have gathered to this burst of passion? Can I be a man? and withstand it no i'll sacrifice the whole sex to her ah but here comes the father quite apropos i'll open the matter immediately settle the business with him and take the sweet girl down to ogleby house to-morrow morning but what the devil miss sterling too what mischief's in the wind now and to sterling and miss sterling my lord your servant i am attending my daughter here upon a rather disagreeable affair speak to his lordship betsy your eyes miss sterling for i always read the eyes of a young lady betray some little emotion what are your commands madam i have but too much cause for my emotion my lord i cannot commend my kinsman's behaviour madam he has behaved like a false knight i must confess i've heard of his apostasy miss fanny has informed me of it miss fanny's baseness has been the cause of sir john's inconstancy nay now my dear miss sterling your passion transports you too far sir john may have entertained a passion for miss fanny but believe me my dear miss sterling believe me Miss Fanny has no passion for Sir John. She has a passion, indeed, a most tender passion. She has opened her whole soul to me, and I know where her affections are placed. Conceitedly. Not upon Mr. Lovewell, my lord, for I have great reason to think that her seeming attachment to him is by his consent made use of as a blind to cover her designs upon Sir John love well no poor lad she does not think of him smiling have a care my lord that both the families are not made the dupes of sir john's artifice and my sister's dissimulation you don't know her indeed my lord you don't know her a base insinuating presidious it is too much she has been beforehand with me i perceive such unnatural behaviour to me but since i can see i have no redress i am resolved that some way or other i will have revenge exit this is foolish work my lord i have too much sensibility to bear the tears of beauty it is touching indeed my lord and very moving for a father to be sure sir you must be distressed beyond measure. Wherefore, to divert your too exquisite feelings, suppose we change the subject and proceed to business. With all my heart, my lord. You see, Mr. Sterling, we can make no union in our families by the proposed marriage. And very sorry I am to see it, my lord. Have you set your heart upon being allied to our house, Mr. Sterling? Tis my only wish at present. My omnium, as I call it. Your wishes shall be fulfilled. Shall they, my lord? But how? How? I'll marry in your family. What? My sister Heidelberg? You throw me into a cold sweat, Mr. Sterling. No not your sister but your daughter my daughter fanny now the murder's out 
What, you, my lord? Yes, I, I, Mr. Sterling. No, no, my lord, that's too much. Too much? I don't comprehend you. What, you, my lord, marry my Fanny? Bless me, what will the folks say? Why, what will they say? That you're a bold man, my lord, that's all. Mr. Sterling, this may be city wit for aught I know. Do you court my alliance? To be sure, my lord. Then I'll explain. My nephew won't marry your eldest daughter, nor I neither. Your youngest daughter won't marry him. I will marry your youngest daughter. What? With a younger daughter's fortune, my lord? With any fortune, or no fortune at all, sir. Love is the idol of my heart, and the demon interest sinks before him. So, sir, as I said before, I will marry your youngest daughter. Your youngest daughter will marry me. Who told you so, my lord? Her own sweet self, sir. Indeed. Yes, sir. Our affection is mutual. Your advantage double and treble. Your daughter will be a countess directly. I shall be the happiest of beings, and you'll be father to an earl instead of a baronet. But what will my sister say? And my daughter? I'll manage that matter. Nay, if they won't consent... I'll run away with your daughter in spite of you. Well said, my lord. Your spirit's good. I wish you had my constitution. But if you'll venture, I have no objection, if my sister has none. I'll answer for your sister, sir, apropos. The lawyers are in the house. I'll have articles drawn, and the whole affair concluded tomorrow morning. Very well and I'll dispatch Lovewell to London immediately for some fresh papers I shall want, and I shall leave you to manage matters with my sister. Uh, you must excuse me, my lord, but I can't help laughing at the match. <laughs> what will the folks say? Exit. What a fellow am I going to make a father of? He has no more feeling than the post in his warehouse. But Fanny's virtues... Tune me to rapture again, and I won't think of the rest of the family. Enter Lovewell hastily. I beg your lordship's pardon, my lord. Are you alone, my lord? No, my lord, I am not alone. I am in company, the best company. My lord? I never was in such exquisite, enchanting company since my heart first conceived, or my senses tasted pleasure where are they my lord looking about in my mind sir what company have you there my lord smiling my own ideas sir which so crowd upon my imagination and kindle it to such a delirium of ecstasy that wit wine music poetry all combined in each perfection are but mere mortal shadows of my felicity i see that your lordship is happy and i rejoice at it you shall rejoice at it sir my felicity shall not selfishly be confined but shall spread its influence to the whole circle of my friends i need not say love well that you shall have your share of it shall i my lord then i understand you you have heard miss fanny has informed you she has i have heard and she shall be happy tis determined then i have reached the summit of my wishes and will your lordship pardon the folly oh yes poor creature how could she help it twas unavoidable fate and necessity it was indeed my lord your kindness distracts me and so it did the poor girl faith she trembled to disclose the secret and declare her affections the world i believe will not think her affections ill-placed 
you are too good my lord and do you really excuse the rashness of the action from my very soul love well your generosity overpowers me bowing i was afraid of her meeting with a cold reception more fool than you who pleads her cause with never failing beauty here finds a full redress strikes his breast she's a fine girl love well her beauty my lord is her least merit she has an understanding her choice convinces me of that that's your lordship's goodness her choice was a disinterested one no no not altogether it began with interest and ended in passion indeed my lord if you were acquainted with her goodness of heart and generosity of mind as well as you are with the inferior beauties of her face and person i am so perfectly convinced of their existence and so totally of your mind touching every amiable particular of that sweet girl that were it not for the cold unfeeling impediments of the law i would marry her to-morrow morning my lord i would by all that's honourable in man and amiable in woman marry her who do you mean my lord miss fanny sterling that is the countess of ogleby that shall be i am astonished why could you expect less from me i did not expect this my lord trade and accounts have destroyed your feeling no indeed my lord sighs <sighs> the moment that love and pity entered my breast i was resolved to plunge into matrimony and shorten the girl's tortures i never do anything by halves do i love well no indeed my lord sighs what an accident what's the matter love well thou seems to have lost thy faculties why don't you wish me joy man oh i do my lord sighs <sighs> she said that you would explain what she had not power to utter but i wanted no interpreter for the language of love but has your lordship considered the consequences of your resolution no sir i am above consideration when my desires are kindled but consider the consequences my lord to your nephew sir john sir john has considered no consequences himself mr lovewell mr sterling my lord will certainly refuse his daughter to sir john sir john has already refused mr sterling's daughter but what will become of miss sterling my lord what's that to you you may have her if you will i depend upon mr sterling's city philosophy to be reconciled to lord ogleby's being his son-in-law instead of sir john melville baronet don't you think that your matter may be brought to that without having recourse to his calculations eh lovewell but my lord that is not the question whatever is the question i'll tell you my answer i am in love with a fine girl whom i resolve to marry enter sir john melville what news with you sir john you look all hurry and impatience like a messenger after a battle after a battle indeed my lord i have this day had a severe engagement and wanting your lordship as an auxiliary i have at last mustered up resolution to declare what my duty to you and to myself have demanded from me some time to the business then and be as concise as possible for i am upon the wing eh lovewell he smiles and lovewell bows i find tis in vain my lord to struggle against the force of inclination very true nephew i am your witness and will second the motion shan't i lovewell smiles and lovewell bows your lordship's generosity encourages me to tell you that i cannot marry miss sterling i am not at all surprised at it she's a bitter potion that's the truth of it 
but as you were to swallow it and not i it was your business and not mine anything more but this my lord that i may be permitted to take my addresses to the other sister oh yes by all means have you any hopes there nephew do you think he'll succeed lovewell smiles and winks at lovewell i think not my lord gravely i think so too but let the fool try will your lordship favour me with your good offices to remove the chief obstacle to the match the repugnance of mrs heidelberg mrs heidelberg had not you better begin with the young lady first it will save you a great deal of trouble won't it lovewell <laughs> but do what you please it will be the same thing to me won't it lovewell conceitedly why don't you laugh at him i do my lord and your lordship will endeavour to prevail on mrs heidelberg to consent to my marriage with miss fanny i'll speak to mrs heidelberg about the adorable fanny as soon as possible your generosity transports me poor fellow what a dupe he little thinks who's in possession of the town aside and your lordship is not offended at this seeming inconstancy not in the least miss fanny's charms will even excuse infidelity i look upon women as the fair nature lawful game and every man who is qualified has a natural right to pursue them love well as well as you and i as well as either of you every man shall do his best without offence to any what say you kinsman you have made me happy my lord and me i assure you my lord and i am superlatively so allons donc to horse and away boys you to your affairs and i to mine revoir les amours sings exeunt severally end of act four Act Five of the Clandestine Marriage by David Garrick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One, Fanny's Apartment. Enter Lovewell and Fanny, followed by Betty. Why did you come so soon, Mr. Lovewell? The family is not yet in bed, and Betty certainly heard somebody listening near the chamber door. My mistress is right, sir. Evil spirits are abroad, and I am sure you are both too good not to expect mischief from them. But who can be so curious or so wicked? I think we have wickedness and curiosity enough in this family, sir, to expect the worst. I do expect the worst. Prithee, Betty, return to the outward door, and listen if you hear anybody in the gallery, and let us know directly. I warrant you, ma'am. The Lord bless you both. Exit. What did my father want with you this evening? He gave me the key of his closet with orders to bring from London some papers relating to Lord Ogilby. And why did you not obey him? Because I'm certain that his lordship has opened his heart to him about you and those papers are wanted merely on that account but as we shall discover all to-morrow there will be no occasion for them and it would be idle in me to go hark hark bless me how i tremble i feel the terrors of guilt indeed mr lovewell this is too much for me and for me too my sweet fanny your apprehensions make a coward of me but what can alarm you your aunt and sister are in their chambers and you have nothing to fear from the rest of the family i fear everybody and everything and every moment my mind is in continual agitation and dread indeed mr lovewell this situation may have very unhappy consequences Weeps but it shan't 
i would rather tell our story this moment to all the house and run the risk of maintaining you by the hardest labour than suffer you to remain in this dangerous perplexity what shall i sacrifice all my best hopes and affections in your dear health and safety for the mean and in such a case the meanest consideration of our fortune were we to be abandoned by all our relations we have that in our hearts and minds will weigh against the most affluent circumstances i should not have proposed the secrecy of our marriage but for your sake and with hopes that the most generous sacrifice you have made to love and me might be less injurious to you by waiting a lucky moment of reconciliation hush hush for heaven's sake my dear lovewell don't be so warm your generosity gets the better of your prudence you will be heard and we shall be discovered i am satisfied indeed i am excuse the weakness this delicacy this what you will my mind's at peace indeed it is think no more of it if you love me that one word has charmed me as it always does to the most implicit obedience it would be the worst of ingratitude in me to distress you a moment kisses her re-enter betty betty in a low voice i'm sorry to disturb you ha huh, what's the matter have you heard anybody yes yes i have and they have heard you too or i'm mistaken if they had seen you too we should have been in a fine quandary prithee don't prate now betty what did you hear i was preparing myself as usual to take me a little nap a nap yes sir a nap for i watch much better so than wide awake and when i had wrapped this handkerchief round my head for fear of the earache of the keyhole i thought i had heard a kind of a sort of buzzing which i first took for a gnat and shook my head two or three times and went so with my hand well well and so and so madam when i heard mr lovewell a little loud i heard the buzzing louder too and pulling off my handkerchief softly i could hear this sort of noise makes an indistinct noise like speaking well and what did they say oh i could not understand a word of what was said the outward door is locked yes and i bolted it too for fear of the worst why did you they must have heard you if they were near and i did it on purpose madam and coughed a little too that they might not hear mr lovewell's voice when i was silent they were silent and so i came to tell you what shall we do fear nothing we know the worst it will only bring on our catastrophe a little too soon but betty might fancy this noise she's in the conspiracy and can make a man of a mouse at any time i can distinguish a man from a mouse as well as my betters i'm sorry you think so ill of me sir he compliments you don't be a fool now you have set her tongue a-running she'll mutter for an hour to love well i'll go and hearken myself Exit. I'll turn my back upon no girl for sincerity and service. Half aside and muttering. Thou art the first in the world for both, and I will reward you soon, Betty, for one and the other. I'm not mercenary either. I can live on a little with a good carter. Re enter Fanny. All seems quiet. Suppose, my dear, you go to your own room i shall be much easier then and to-morrow we will be prepared for the discovery you may discover if you please but for my part i shall still be secret half aside and muttering should i leave you now if they still are upon the watch we shall lose the advantage of our delay besides we should consult upon to-morrow's business let betty go to her own room and lock the outward door after her we can fasten this and when she thinks all safe she may return and let me out as usual shall i madam do let me have my way to-night and you shall command me ever after i would not have you surprised here for the world pray leave me i shall be quite myself again if you will oblige me 
i live only to oblige you my sweet fanny i'll be gone this moment going let us listen first at the door that you may not be intercepted betty shall go first and if they lay hold of her they'll have the wrong sow by the ear i can tell them that going hastily softly softly betty don't venture out if you hear a noise softly i beg of you see mr lovewell the effects of indiscretion but love fanny makes amends for all exeunt all softly scene changes to a gallery which leads to several bedchambers and to miss sterling leading mrs heidelberg in a nightcap this way dear madame and then i'll tell you all nay but niece consider a little don't drag me out in this figure let me put on my fly cap if any of my lord's family or the counsellors at law should be stirring i should be prodigious disconcarted but my dear madame a moment is an age in my situation i am sure my sister has been plotting my disgrace and ruin in that chamber oh she's all crafted wickedness well but softly betsy you are all in emotion your mind is too much flustrated you can neither eat nor drink nor take your natural rest compose yourself child for if we are not as wearisome as they are wicked we shall disgrace ourselves and the whole family we are disgraced already madame sir john melville has forsaken me my lord cares for nobody but himself or if for anybody it is my sister my father for the sake of a better bargain would marry me to a change broker so that if you madame don't continue my friend if you forsake me if i am to lose my best hopes and consolation in your tenderness and affections i had better at once give up the matter and let my sister enjoy the fruits of her treachery trample with scorn upon the rights of her eldest sister the will of the best of aunts and the weakness of a too interested father she pretends to be bursting into tears all this speech don't betsy keep up your spirit i hate whimpering i am your friend depend upon me in every particular but be composed and tell me what new mischief you have discovered i had no desire to sleep and would not undress myself knowing that my machiavel's sister would not rest till she had broke my heart i was so uneasy that i could not stay in my room but when i thought that all the house was quiet i sent my maid to discover what was going forward she immediately came back and told me that they were in high consultation that she had heard only for it was in the dark my sister's maid conduct sir john melville to her mistress and then locked the door and how did you conduct yourself in this dilemma i returned with her and could hear a man's voice though nothing that they said distinctly and you may depend upon it that sir john is now in that room and they have settled the matter and will run away together before morning if we don't prevent them why the brazen slut has she got her sister's husband that is to be locked up in her chamber at night too i tremble at the thoughts hush madame i hear something you frighten me let me put on my fly cap i would not be seen in this figure for the world tis dark madame you can't be seen i protest there's a candle coming and a man too nothing but servants let us retire a moment they retire enter brush half drunk laying hold of the chambermaid who has a candle in her hand be quiet mr brush i shall drop down with terror but my sweet and most amiable chambermaid if you have no love you may hearken to a little reason that cannot possibly do your virtue any harm 
But you will do me harm, Mr. Brush, and a great deal of harm, too. Pray let me go. I'm ruined if they hear you. I tremble like an asp. But they shan't hear us. And if you have a mind to be ruined, it shall be the making of your fortune, you little slut you. Therefore I say it again. If you have no love, hear a little reason. I wonder at your imprudence, Mr. Brush, to use me in this manner. This is not the way to keep me company, I assure you. You are a town rake, I see, and now you are a little in liquor, you fear nothing. Nothing, by heavens, but your frowns, most amiable chambermaid. I am a little electrified, that's the truth on it. I'm not used to drink port, and your master's is so heady that a pint of it oversets a claret drinker. Don't be rude, bless me. I shall be ruined. What will become of me? I'll take care of you by all that's honorable. You are a base man to use me so. I'll cry out if you don't let go. That is Miss Sterling's chamber, and that is Miss Fanny's, and that Madame Heidelberg's. Pointing. And that my Lord Ogilby's. And that my lady, what ye call him? I don't mind such folks when I'm sober, much less when I am whimsical. Rather above that, too. More shame for you, Mr. Brush. You terrify me. You have no modesty. Oh, but I have, my sweet spider brusher. For instance, I reverence Miss Fanny. She's a most delicious morsel, and fit for a prince. With all my horrors of matrimony, I could marry her myself. But for her sister— There, there, madame, all in a story. Bless me, Mr. Brush. I heard something. Rats, I suppose, that are gnawing the old timbers of this execrable old dungeon. If it was mine, I would pull it down and fill your fine canal up with the rubbish. And then I should get rid of two damned things at once. Law, law, how you blaspheme! We shall have the house upon our heads for it. No, no, it will last our time. But as I was saying, the eldest sister, Miss Jezebel, is a fine young lady for all your evil tongue. No, we have smoked her already, and unless she marries our old Swiss, she can have none of us. No, no, she won't do. We are a little too nice. You're a monstrous rake, Mr. Brush, and I don't care what you say. Why, for that matter, my dear, I am a little inclined to mischief, and if you won't have pity upon me, I will break open that door and ravish Miss Heidelberg. There's no bearing this, you profligate monster! Uh, I am undone! Sounds, here she is, by all that's monstrous. Runs off. A fine discourse you have had with that fellow. And a fine time of night it is to be here with that drunken monster. What have you to say for yourself? I can say nothing. I am so frightened and so ashamed. But indeed I am virtuous. I am virtuous indeed. Well, well, don't tremble so. But tell us what you know of this horrible plot here. We'll forgive you, if you'll discover all. Why, madam, don't let me betray my fellow servants. I shan't sleep in my bed if I do. Then you shall sleep somewhere else tomorrow night. Oh, dear, what shall I do? Tell us this moment, or I'll turn you out of doors directly. Uh, why... Our butler has been treating us below in the pantry. Mr. Brush forced us to make a kind of holiday night of it. Holiday? For what? Nay, I only made one. Well? Well? But upon what account? Because, as how, madam, there was a change in the family, they said. That his honor, Sir John, was to marry Miss Fanny instead of your ladyship. And so you made a holiday for that? Very fine. I did not make it, ma'am. But do you know nothing of Sir John's being to run away with Miss Fanny tonight? No, indeed, ma'am. Nor of his being locked up in my sister's chamber. No, as I hope for mercy, ma'am. Well, I'll put an end to all this directly. Do you run to my brother Sterling? No, ma'am, tis so very late, ma'am. I don't care how late it is. Tell him there are thieves in the house, that the house is afire. Tell him to come here immediately. Go, I say. I will. I will, though I'm frightened out of my wits. 
Exit. Do you watch here, my dear, and I'll put myself in order to face them. We'll plot em and counterplot em too. Exit into her chamber. I have as much pleasure in this revenge as being made a countess. Ha! They are unlocking the door. Now for it. Retires. Fanny's door is unlocked and Betty comes out with a candle. Miss Sterling approaches her. Betty calling within. Sir, sir, now's your time. All's clear. Seeing Miss Sterling. Stay, stay, not yet. We are watched. And so you are, Madam Betty. Miss Sterling lays hold of her while Betty locks the door and puts the key in her pocket. Betty turning round. What's the matter, madam? Nay, that you shall tell my father and aunt, madam. I am no telltale, madam, and no thief. They'll get nothing from me. You have a great deal of courage, Betty, and considering the secret you have to keep, you have occasion for it. My mistress shall never repent her good opinion of me, ma'am. Enter Sterling. What is all this? What's the matter? Why am I disturbed in this manner? This creature and my distresses, sir, will explain the matter. Re-enter Mrs. Heidelberg with another headdress. Now I'm prepared for the rencounter. Well, brother, have you heard of this scene of wickedness? Not I, but what is it? Speak. I was got into my little closet. All the lawyers were in bed, and I had almost lost my senses in the confusion of Lord Ogilby's mortgages when I was alarmed with a foolish girl who could hardly speak, and whether it's fire, or thieves, or murder, or rape, I am quite in the dark. No, no, there's no rape, brother. All parties are willing, I believe. Who's in that chamber? Detaining Betty, who seemed to be stealing away. My mistress. And who is with your mistress? Why, who should there be? Open the door, then, and let us see. The door is open, madam. Miss Sterling goes to the door. I'll sooner die than peach. Exit hastily. The door's locked, and she has got the key in her pocket. There's impudence, brother, piping hot from your daughter Fanny's school. But, Zunes, what is all this about? You tell me of a sum total. And you don't produce the particulars. Sir John Meville is locked up in your daughter's bedchamber. There is the particular. The devil he is. That's bad. And he has been there some time, too. Ditto. Ditto? Worse and worse, I say. I'll raise the house and expose him to my lord and the whole family. By no means. We shall expose ourselves, sister. The best way is to ensure privately. Let me alone. I'll make him marry her tomorrow morning. Make him marry her? This is beyond all patience. You have thrown away all your affection, and I shall do as much by my obedience. Unnatural fathers make unnatural children. My revenge is my own power, and I'll indulge it. Had they made their escape, I should have been exposed to the derision of the world. But the deriders shall be derided, and so... Help! Help! There! Thieves! Thieves! Tit for tat, Betsy. You are right, my girl. Zunes, you'll spoil all. You'll raise the whole family. The devil's in the girl. No. No, the devil's in you, brother. I am ashamed of your principles. What? Would you connive at your daughter's being locked up with her sister's husband? Help! Thieves! Thieves, I say! Cries out. Sister, I beg you. Daughter, I command you. If you have no regard for me, consider yourselves. We shall lose this opportunity of ennobling our blood and getting above twenty per cent for our money. What? By my disgrace and my sister's triumph, I have a spirit above such mean consideration, and to show you that it is not a low-bred, vulgar, change-alley spirit, help, help, thieves, thieves, 
thieves, I say. Aye, aye, you may save your lungs. The house is in an uproar. Women at best have no discretion. But in a passion they'll fire a house or burn themselves in it, rather than not be revenged. Enter Canton in a nightgown and slippers. Eh, hey, Diablo, what is the reason of this great noise, this tintamare? Ask those ladies, sir. Tis of their making. Lord Ogleby calls within. Bruch, Bruch, Canton, where are you? What's the matter? Rings a bell. Where are you? Tis my lord calls, Mr. Canton. I come, my lord. Exit Canton. Lord Ogleby still rings. Sergeant Flower calls within. A light! A light here! Where are the servants? Bring a light for me and my brothers. Lights here. Lights for the gentlemen. Exit Sterling. My brother feels, I see, your sister's turn will come next. Ay, ay, let it go round, madame, is the only comfort I have left. Re-enter Sterling with lights, before Sergeant Flower, with one boot and a slipper, and traverse. This way, sir. This way, gentlemen. Well, but, Mr. Sterling, no danger, I hope. Have they made a burglarious entry? Are you prepared to repulse them? I am very much alarmed about thieves at circuit time. They would be particularly severe with us gentlemen of the bar. No danger, Mr. Sterling. No trespass, I hope. None, gentlemen, but of those ladies making. You'll be ashamed to know, gentlemen, that all your labours and studies about this young lady are thrown away. Sir John Meville is at this moment locked up with this lady's younger sister. The thing is a little extraordinary, to be sure, but why were we to be frightened out of our beds for this? Could not we have tried this cause tomorrow morning? But, sir, by tomorrow morning, perhaps, even your assistance would not have been of any service. The birds now in that cage would have flown away. Enter Lord Ogleby, in his robe de chambre, nightcap, leaning on Canton. I had rather lose a limb than my night's rest. What's the matter with you all? Aye, aye, tis all over. Here's my lord, too. What's all this shrieking and screaming? Where's my angelic Fanny? She's safe, I hope. Your angelic Fanny, my lord, is locked up with your angelic nephew in that chamber. My nephew? Then will I be excommunicated? Your nephew, my lord, has been plotting to run away with the younger sister, and the younger sister has been plotting to run away with your nephew. And if we had not watched them and called up the family, they had been upon the scamper to Scotland by this time. Look ye, ladies, I know that Sir John has conceived a violent passion for Miss Fanny, and I know, too, that Miss Fanny has conceived a violent passion for another person and I am so well convinced of the rectitude of her affections that I will support them with my fortune, my honour, and my life. Eh, shan't I, Mr. Sterling? Smiling. What say you? Sterling sulkily. To be sure, my lord. These bawling women have been the ruin of everything. Aside. But come, I'll end this business in a trice. If you ladies will compose yourselves, and Mr. Sterling will ensure Miss Fanny from violence, I will engage to draw her from her pillow with a whisper through the keyhole. The horrid creatures! I say, my lord, break the door open. Let me beg of your delicacy not to be too precipitate. Now to our experiment. Advancing towards the door. Now what will they do? My heart will beat through my bosom. Enter Betty with the key. There's no occasion for breaking open doors, my lord. We have done nothing that we ought to be ashamed of, and my mistress shall face her enemies. Going to unlock the door. There's impudence. 
The mystery thickens. Lady of the bedchamber. To Betty. Open the door and entreat Sir John Melville, for these ladies will have it that he is there, to appear in answer to high crimes and misdemeanors. Call Sir John Melville into the court. Enter Sir John Melville on the other side. I am here, my lord. A day! Astonishment! What is all this alarm and confusion? There is nothing but hurry in the house. What is the reason for it? Because you have been in that chamber. Have been. Nay, you are there at this moment, as these ladies have protested. So don't deny it. This is the clearest alibi I ever knew, Mr. Sergeant. Lucy Clarius. Upon my word, ladies, if you have often these frolics, it would be really entertaining to pass a whole summer with you. But come. To Betty. Open the door and entreat your amiable mistress to come forth and dispel all our doubts with her smiles. Betty opening the door. Madam, you are wanted in this room. Pertly. Enter Fanny in great confusion. You see? She's ready dressed. And what confusion she's in. Ready to pack off bag and baggage. Her guilt confounds her. Silence in the court, ladies! I am confounded indeed, madam. Don't droop, my beauteous lily. But with your own peculiar modesty, declare your state of mind. Pour conviction into their ears and raptures into mine. Smiling. I am at this moment the most unhappy. The tumult is too much for my heart, and I want the power to reveal a secret which to conceal has been the misfortune and misery of my, my... Faints away. She faints. Help, help, for the fairest and best of women. Oh, my dear mistress, help, help, there. Ha, huh. let me fly to her assistance. Lovewell rushes out from the chamber. My fanny in danger i can contain no longer prudence were now a crime all other cares were lost in this speak speak to me my dearest fanny let me but hear thy voice open your eyes and bless me with the smallest sign of life during this speech they are all in amazement lovewell i am easy i am thunderstruck I am petrified. And I undone. Fanny recovering. Oh, Lovewell, even supported by thee, I dare not look my father nor his lordship in the face. What now? Did I not send you to London, sir? Hey, what? How's this? By what right and title have you been half the night in that lady's bedchamber? by that right which makes me the happiest of men and by a title which i would not forego for any the best of kings could give me i could cry my eyes out to hear his magnanimity i am annihilated i have been choked with rage and wonder but now i can speak soon what have you to say to me lovewell you are a villain you have broke your word with me. Indeed, sir, he has not. You forbade him to think of me when it was out of his power to obey you. We have been married these four months. And he shan't stay in my house four hours. What baseness and treachery! As for you, you shall repent this step as long as you live, madam. Indeed, sir. It is impossible to conceive the tortures I have already endured in consequence of my disobedience. My heart has continually upbraided me for it, and though I was too weak to struggle with affection, I feel I must be miserable forever without your forgiveness. Lovewell, you shall leave my house directly, and you shall follow him, madam. To Fanny. And if they do, I will receive them into mine. Look ye, Mr. Sterling, there have been some mistakes, 
mistakes which we had all better forget for our own sakes and the best way to forget them is to forgive the cause of them which i do from my soul poor girl i swore to support her affection with my life and fortune tis a debt of honour it must be paid you swore as much too mr sterling but your laws in the city will excuse you i suppose for you never strike a balance without errors accepted i am a father my lord but for the sake of all other fathers i think i ought not to forgive her or fear of encouraging other silly girls like herself to throw themselves away without the consent of their parents i hope there will be no danger of that sir young ladies with minds like my fanny's would startle at the very shadow of vice and when they know to what uneasiness only an indiscretion has exposed her her example instead of encouraging will rather serve to deter them indiscretion quoth he a mighty pretty delicate word to express disobedience for my part i indulge my own passions too much to tyrannize over those of other people poor souls i pity them you must forgive them too come come melt a little of your flint mr sterling why why as to that my lord to be sure he is a relation of yours my lord oh, what say you sister heidelberg the girl's ruined and i forgive her well so do i then nay no thanks to lovewell and fanny who seem preparing to speak there's an end to the matter but lovewell what makes you dumb all this while your kindness my lord i can scarce believe my own senses they are all in a tumult of fear joy love expectation and gratitude i ever was and now more bound in duty to your lordship for you mr sterling if every moment of my life spent gratefully in your service will in some measure compensate the want of fortune you perhaps will not repent your goodness to me and you ladies i flatter myself will not for the future suspect me of artifice and intrigue i shall be happy to oblige and serve you as for you sir john no apologies to me love well i do not deserve any all i have to offer in excuse for what has happened is my total ignorance of your situation had you dealt a little more openly with me you would have saved me and yourself and that lady who i hope will pardon my behaviour a great deal of uneasiness give me leave however to assure you that light and capricious as i may have appeared now my infatuation is over i have sensibility enough to be ashamed of the part i have acted and honour enough to rejoice at your happiness and now my dearest fanny though we are seemingly the happiest of beings yet all our joys will be damped if his lordship's generosity and mr sterling's forgiveness should not be succeeded by the indulgence approbation and consent of these our best benefactors to the audience end of act five end of the clandestine marriage by david garrick